Hello, my friends, thinkers, and gamers. It's Friday night. Thank you so much for choosing to spend it with us. I'm going to do my best to make it worth your while. In fact, I was late because I was um, collecting some information with which to kick off the stream. So look forward to that in a moment. We can get nice and situated in Tales of Graces. But first, let me welcome you back, or perhaps for the first time, to Tales of Praxis. I'm your host, Aaron Saduco, the founder of WithTheTerribleFate.com, your first and final source for all literary studies of video games. If you consume games in the way that people consume books, you find yourself drawn in by their themes and orienting your place in the world, uh, in large part relative to the journeys you have in video games. You are not alone. In fact, you have found your home. Welcome home. If you're a fan of JRPGs, you've found an even more specific home because Tales of Praxis is a series I've been running for With a Terrible Fate for the better part of a year at this point, looking just at Bandai Namco's wonderful masterpiece work that is the Tales or Tales of series of JRPGs. It's a series that meant a hell of a lot to me growing up informed how I think about games, stories, philosophy, and meant a hell of a lot of a variety of things to a whole generation and, in fact, multiple generations of gamers. So I decided in my adulthood and working in the philosophy of video games now uh, to revisit this series, think about what it meant to me as a kid, what it means to me now, uh, to replay games that shaped me into who I am, and to play the ones that I never got to, to fill in the gaps and think about the language both on a game-by-game -game basis and on an intertextual basis for the series as a whole, uh, for what it is that these games are concerned with, what they're trying to express to their players, uh, and the various storytelling and interactive mechanisms through which they do it. It's been a romp so far, I think it's fair to say. I'll speak for everyone and say it has been a romp. <laughs> In Midius Res Chat, that's right. Good evening, Grail. Good to see you. Um, we have been doing two things for Tales of Praxis on With a Terrible Fate so far. One is long-form written publication, studying every aspect of the series from really touching individual moments in these games to characters to comparative studies between the games. Um, long-form written content is With a Terrible Fate's bread and butter, although we also do a lot of podcasts and lectures and now streams such as this one. And that, in fact, has been the other major horn of the Tales of Praxis series, these live book club adventures that we have been on, I think, since March. I think March is when we started. Uh, but it feels like in some ways just yesterday that we started and in some ways five years ago, which I think is the perfect hallmark for any series that intends to study JRPGs because as we know, they have a way of bending time themselves, don't they? We've been through, uh, I think more or less five at this point because this is our fifth full length one, but we've also done a few DLCs along the way, one of which was substantive. Uh, and I was remarking actually to a friend of mine earlier today that uh, I really do feel like this is the sweet spot where finally, after all the work that we've put in, uh, we're starting to have enough mutual background in the series uh, for some of that language to become regimented and thinking about these games and to actually empower us to see a lot of these cool insights uh, and moments in games like Tales of Graces that we might not otherwise have noticed, that I certainly wouldn't otherwise have noticed. So the payoff is starting. It's the best time to be tuning in. That's the best pitch I can make to you. I'm doing well, Grail. Thank you for asking. I hope you'll tell me and tell the stream how you're doing as well. Um, I'll be honest, since since it's you and our dear Tales of Praxis gamers, I'm doing quite well. I'm definitely a little bit overwhelmed at this moment because uh, this coming week actually is when applications to PhD programs start coming due. And so it's been a long haul and it will be definitely be one of those final pushes in the quest uh, of a weekend to get all of my uh, application materials in order, especially this writing sample that I've been working on, as I've been telling the stream about. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a busy and hectic time uh, between that and also preparing for my friends and colleagues whom you will see on the stream, uh, probably on Friday and for a little while thereafter. Got my dear friend Dan Hughes and Dr. Matt McGill coming, uh, and I'm, I know they're both uh, here for a good time when it comes to streaming. They've both been on the stream in the past. If you're a longtime um, viewer, you will recognize them when they show up. So it's an exciting time of the year. 
uh, with plenty of different projects to juggle. Uh, and then I'll be turning back to writing for Tales of Praxis after that. So uh, I don't think it's a mark of a bad life to be busy. The key is just to be busy with the right things. So it's definitely one of those instances, but all the better to be able to sit and breathe and enjoy three hours of gaming and thinking uh, with you fine folks, you especially, Grail. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And you know I wish you the best with all of your projects. Got a little repeatlet update. I uh, don't. I feel like she's been off the stream for a little bit, but she's doing well too. Actually, I have to take her to the vet tomorrow too. That's another thing on my plate, but you know that's uh, one of the uh, tolls, I guess, of having a pet. Sometimes you gotta take them in for checkups. It's all uh, all part of the fun. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's good to know I'm in good company. I appreciate the uh, the empathy. That means a lot. Uh, if we're to believe Tales of Graces, that's, uh, that's where the whole game is in many ways. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm really excited to have more friends on the stream. Uh, well, more real life friends, plenty of friends in the, in the cyber ether, but more live friends for you to enjoy on the stream this coming week. I'm sure we'll have a new podcast for you too. We don't need to dwell on the game awards, but suffice to say, there's some interesting stuff that dropped. So as if I didn't already have enough gaming related things to keep up with, oh my goodness, they keep burying me. Send help. This is not a joke. This is a cry for support. <laughs> um, and, and we'll have more written content uh, for Tales of Praxis thereafter as well. Um, I think those are the main updates on With a Terrible Fate. Again, I don't wanna I don't wanna tease too much, but I will say one thing that was also a highlight this week was I got back in touch with someone who had been working with me a few years ago in hopes of becoming an analyst and she shared some new work with me. She still remains interested. Uh, things with With a Terrible Fate sometimes go off and on in terms of overall productivity, um, honestly, based on the bandwidth that I have to give to it in my own life. Uh, but as you can tell, things are very much on now uh, and she's excited to be back in the mix. And uh, without spoiling anything, I'll just say I had the privilege of reading an early draft of some work that she wants to share on the site. It's a game with which many of you will be familiar. It's a game we've published on before. And I myself, despite having spent um, more time than any human ought to in this game, got a totally new take on it uh, just from reading her work and getting her perspective. So a great poster child for the kind of analysis that we strive to support uh, and empower. And I'm excited to share that with you in the future as well. I think that's the other update. Hey, Padre, welcome back to the chat. Good to see you. Oh, that's so funny. I totally missed that. Leave it to you to pick that up. Well, there you go. And another beautiful moment that uh, even in the most recent Tales content, the Beyond the Dawn DLC, there are quiet little cameos that you could easily miss. And that, in fact, I easily missed uh, to shouting out the earlier games. So very cool. Uh, already giving me reason to want to go back and play that on top of all the other reasons. Well, friends, uh, as I said, I hope that you two are having a rewarding, manageable week, busy with the right things, and that you're easing into a fun weekend of gaming and thinking and just enjoying the end of the year. Oh, okay. So I, I intuited it at the time. I just wasn't sure about it. There you go. Leave it to you, having more recent experiences in my own past so that you can correct me about what I, uh, what I thought at the time. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, let's jump over to Tales of Graces here. An interesting work week, all right. I haven't touched Elden Ring, okay. Working through more fighting game stuff, I'm shocked. <laughs> Cute girl with a gun, it sounds very you, Grail. I love it. <laughs> nice, sounds like a, uh, a week of same old, same old uh, in, in a good way for you, I hope a good way. I never know what you mean when you say interesting work week, but I hope it's on net good. Um, we're on another planet, you may or may not recall, uh, and we were already debating frames of reference in the pre-stream uh, pre chat, so you know it's going to be a fun stream, an interstellar, or dare I say, cosmic stream. And uh, the reason that I was late, actually, was that I was doing my homework for all of you, and it's homework that's ongoing, but like I said at the end of Wednesday's stream, I wanted to spend at least a little bit of time tinkering with names, uh, because... As you know, if you've been watching the stream, I would contend that Tales of Graces F is especially concerned with ideas around naming, 
and titles and the thematic significance of that, even though it's something we certainly see come up again and again in many of these games. But I, I think it's not uh, inaccurate to say that Tales of Graces centers that um, in its uh, center of gravity, if you will, in a way that pretty much none of the other games do, at least that I can think of off the top of my head. And so, no, I didn't get to Asbel, but what I did was what, what I set out to do, uh, thinking about some of the more, um, I would say, obviously inspired by real world things names. Um, and I wish, I wish I had an engineer or a mathematician on hand to extend this more easily to all the names that we get with the Amarcians. But what I did was I began to do a little work uh, looking at and thinking about the meanings of things like Lambda and Protos Haste, especially because as we saw in the last stream, those are increasingly taking center stage and um, time willing, we're gonna learn a whole more about them, I would suspect this evening as well. Um, Especially with Lambda, if, if you're not familiar, it's a letter of the Greek alphabet, as with uh, many letters of the Greek alphabet. It's been used as a symbol to represent a ton of different things. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm offering some thoughts while trying to avoid spoilers, because you'll also know, well, a number of us hanging out here have played the game before. Lambda has been pointed to and talked about as this sort of oppressive force that has threatened the world in the past uh, in the game so far, but we haven't gotten a lot of the details. And so I'm going to talk around the details. And if you know, you know, and if you don't, I, I can't imagine anything that I'm going to say is going to spoil it for you. Um, but Greek letter, Lambda, Protos Haze, I always have trouble because um, I didn't do any kind of classical language stuff um, coming up in school. And, and I have trouble finding the right online dictionaries for languages like Latin and Greek. But I did a little bit of digging trying to root around in Greek, especially because of Lambda. And it looked like, again, from a cursory first pass analysis, this is somewhat in keeping with what we were talking about last time. Um, protos meaning the first, which is pretty intuitive. And haste can mean a few different things, um, but it comes up in reference uh, to ordinals as the one, like identifying a single one. Uh, and so I think, at least to me as someone who doesn't have a Greek background at first pass, it seems relatively intuitive to have it um, interpreted or translated as the first one. And we've already kind of gotten some indication of why that might be a meaningful uh, way to describe Sophie in terms of what she was maybe engineered for. And again, as we get deeper into the stream tonight, I imagine we might get a little bit more background there. <laughs> that's the real, uh, that's that's the deep lore of this Grace's stream grail. It's how do we arrive at the apex of the Lambda male? <laughs> oh, I'm sure we'll have some ideas on that before all is said and done. So in terms of Lambda, like I said, it's been used for many different things, but I wanted to call out three that struck me as interesting as I was reviewing um, the at least the Wikipedia version of a master list of the main things it's been used for as things that might be relevant uh, to the game. So the first one, which is not to me as thematically interesting, but I couldn't not mention it because of a reason you will see quite obviously in a moment. Uh, it's actually uh, a symbol that is used in referencing Poisson distributions. So Poisson, you might remember, a uh, real world mathematician, also um, actually, in fact, an Amarcian represented in this game. So we have that kind of nice uh, connection in the text, but it represents, um, so a Poisson distribution is basically a way of measuring the probability of events occurring in a certain frame of reference. Uh, and Lambda, I guess, uh, is a symbol that is used to represent the density of uh, probability of occurrences of an event within a given time interval. So kind of bounding a certain um, amount of the Poisson distribution, if you will. So that was one that I had to call out because of the name. The other two are more thematically interesting to me. Um, one, actually funnily enough, given that we're on another planet now and a lot of what we're concerned in this game with seems to be uh, addressing engineering related questions and also ast uh, astronomy questions and cosmological questions. Um, Lambda is actually used as a representation in cosmology, so like the study of the cosmos and the expanding universe and everything um, to denote 
the presence of dark matter. So when you're accounting for things like the overall size or the expansion of the universe, uh, that's used basically as the, uh, the name for dark matter in those equations or theorems. Um, dark matter on a, a very pedestrian take, basically pointing out a lot of that stuff that's out there in the universe that we can't really measure. It uh, doesn't really interact with other things in a way that makes it perceptible, uh, but we can infer its existence based on our observations of all the other stuff that's out there in the universe. So this kind of stuff that is there, but not there and doesn't quite connect with the rest of the stuff in the universe in a way that renders it intelligible to us. And again, if you know where we're going in terms of Lambda, hopefully you can start to see some of the thematic connections that I'm thinking about and spinning out. Uh, and I won't say more than that, but hopefully very soon we will um, get a better picture into why that might be interesting. The other one that was interesting to me was that, uh, and this is one where I think it is, um, I think it's fair to talk about in the game, but maybe I still don't want to jump the gun on it. Um, but the other representation of Lambda is actually in, um, in logic and computational systems. It's basically a way of abstracting um, formulas to range across like any possible member of a set that could be input to it. And that sounds complicated because logic is complicated, but actually I found a very good example of it on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And I'll, I'll, I'll drop some links in, um, actually I can just drop some links in the chat now and then I'll, I'll drop it in the VOD after the fact too. Um, where was the window where the links were? If Aaron can keep track of all his links. Uh, I can't find where the window is. I'll drop it later. But so the thought being, if you have a represented equation, um, not even an equation, but just a representation of something like x squared plus 2x plus 3 or something, if we wanted to say, let's put in a certain value for x, like say x equals 2 or x equals 3 or x equals some real number, that putting in function is basically what's represented by lambda. So this idea of abstracting away from a particular equation uh, and letting it range over a bunch of different possible values uh, that could be put into it. Um, that idea of lambda as a function for basically making something more abstract and inserting various substitutions um, strikes me as interesting when we step back and think about some of the things that lambda may or may not be doing in this game. And I've decided because I really don't want to jump the gun on anything that hasn't been explicitly said, I'm going to leave it at that. But again, if you, if you understand the events of the story that have unfolded so far based on where the story is going, you will perhaps be able to intuit where I'm going with that as well. Yeah, and I, th I think at a, um, like at the, right level of abstraction pottery, we're talking about the same thing. Um, because as, as you probably know, um, a lot of computer science at the foundational level just is logic. Uh, and so it, it might be like a specified operation in C++. It's probably an operation that does this exact thing that, that I'm talking about in terms of logic. So perfect. That's, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> I know, Grail. I mean, this is what I'm saying and it's what I've been hammering away at um, really since my Tales of Abyss article. This has been my soapbox um, because it's it's so easy, I think, um, and tempting to look at so many JRPGs and say, oh yeah, you know, the developers were just leafing through books on the mythology and the science of various cultures and picked names that sounded cool with no rhyme or reason just to make their game seem more inaccessible or mystical. And A, in general, I don't think that's fair. But B, especially in the Tales games, um, the reason that I've spent you know probably 10 to 15 minutes now at the start of this stream dwelling on it is that I really do think one of the many things that makes these games so special is that um, the creators really do seem to put a lot of care and thought into the illusions that they make to concepts and aspects of the world um, that are real uh, and reach beyond the game. 
the more stones you turn over in Tales of the Abyss, and if you don't believe me, do check out my article on it on the site, uh, the more pretty well-grounded and justified allusions to different aspects of Jewish mysticism you will find. It goes way deeper than the names of the Sephirot, uh, or the Sephiroth in the games, but it, that points to Sephirot, which are a real concept that's central to Jewish mysticism. But again, those names are not simply to sound cool, rather they're the beginning of a cipher for unpacking so much of the rest of the game. And so too, I think, the more I'm leaning into it with Tales of Grace's F, I think little winks and nods like the names of the Amarsians and like the particular choice of name with Lambda, I think will pro almost certainly, I would say, almost certainly unlock similar registers of meaning. Not in terms of bottoming out in the mystical necessarily, um, although, as we've been talking about in the stream, there's a lot of Buddhism in here too, so that might be the case, uh, but in terms of similar thematic impact on our journey. So it's going to be exciting to keep our eyes peeled for that as we go on. Uh, I'm, I can't wait to watch that with you. <laughs> well, I, I go back and forth on that pottery because I feel like, especially if you're able to arrive at a place where uh, the names are illuminating and you feel as if you've uncovered something. Um, there are certain times, I think, and certain aspects of play according to which I want to be able to just sit back and consume it and it's pretty transparent what's going on. But I think, especially given that at the end of the day it's a video game, right, I think there's something to recommend at least to certain kinds of players or if you're playing with a certain attitude, putting that same sort of playfulness and puzzle solvingness to work uh, in terms of uncovering the meaning of the names and almost as sort of a point of entry into the question of what it is to interpret a text when the text is a video game, right? I think if you're playing a game and you find yourself naturally curious and pulling at the strings of the meaning of names, that can be a really good gateway into the idea of what it even means to interpret a game uh, if that's not something that you've done before. So I think there is some to recommend it. Um, in a similar spirit kind of to the way in which lots of people try to solve the puzzles of the various meanings of item descriptions and dark souls or something like that. Uh, but yes, it's definitely, it depends on what you're looking for and it depends on the particular way in which it's pulled off. I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> Grail, I would love you to turn my Tales of the Abyss article into a drinking game. And if you do, I'm going to insist that you tell me what the drinking game is. And then maybe even I'll sit down and play it with you in spirit. <laughs> oh, that's how you know uh, you've made it, right? Either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a drinking game. I think we all know which is the case for me. <laughs> I know, I know you, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and I, I want to go back and think about it in Tales of Arise 2 pottery because I was going to say, I think you and I have diverging views on that. I'm not even sure if that's true because I really, I, I, I would want to sit down and think more about if there's a good justification we can give for all of the naming conventions holistically in the spirit we were talking about on Wednesday before I fell on one side of the fence or another there. And I just, I frankly haven't done that work with Tales of Arise. But I think once we see this as an interesting kind of question to ask, which I think plenty of the other games support, then it becomes something that we can leverage as we go into any game, which I think is a fun way to think about it uh, and, and get value out of it. <laughs> Dake Faisal might be a bridge too far. I'm not, I'm, I'm man enough to admit that. <laughs> all right, my dear friends. Um, I think that's all I've got. Oh, no, I lied. The last one, and I'll point it out quickly because I already talked about it, um, a couple streams ago because the stream was named after this. But if you look, can I do this on the, on my little cutaway on that side of the, the screen, there, that's roughly right. Uh, the name of the location we're in right now um, on this new planet, Fossilos, um, is Telos Astoi. And for the life of me, I searched around. Again, it was a pretty cursory search. I couldn't figure out what Astoi means. Um, so if, if you find something before I do, let me know. But Telos um, is, again, from, from the Greek tradition and something that was big in Aristotelian philosophy in terms of the purpose of an object uh, or a living being, right? The function that it was designed to serve. So keep that in mind in terms of our previous conversations and also what it is that we've already learned at this location called Telos and what we will continue to learn while we're at, on this planet. Now I'm done. That was my last thing. <laughs> All right, my dear friends. Oh, it's Friday night. So excited to be here with you. We've got some good adventures ahead. Let's roll. 
I think we had almost finished with this floor, but I know there was at least one um, discovery point that we had missed and we hadn't um, done our tour of the shops yet. Please form lines, purchase, keep directly as possible. Oh, the end product of a broken individual in late stage capitalism <laughs> when they just have vague memories of the service structure of society. Charge the mixer, and, ooh, are there requests here? Oh, there are requests here. That's cool, I didn't expect that. Including unusual ones. Oh, we have one from a philosopher. I'm listening. What does the philosopher want? I think, therefore, this is. <laughs> I, I don't think that's quite what Descartes meant. In fact, I'm quite confident it's not but I still love the reference. All things in this world come from truth. As such, I can attain truth from any object I desire. Oh, and now we have to move on because if I stay on this, I'm gonna dwell on that for another 30 minutes. Emerod says, I can't go back to the Humanoid Research Center now that we're under martial law. Can someone please bring me a new drive unit? So I wonder if the thought then is that this is a request from before Emerod was put in stasis because I mean, presumably it's outdated information that they're under martial law. Protos Hayes asked for something. Oh, and the reward is crablets. So this is something that Sophie asked for back when she was here. Did anyone see a brooch in region 66? I was supposed to receive it a long time ago. Oh, so that must be a, a special side quest where we can maybe learn more about Sophie's deep past. That is something I'm excited for. Well, Grail, I'm trusting that you're still keeping an eye on the side quest, so I'm sure we won't miss that. Very cool. And talk about little windows into history and the diversity of those windows that the Tales games provide. <laughs> the idea of seeing the history of a culture based on this now relic of the different um, objects that they wanted help finding. What a specific texture to the, uh, the contours of a society and, and the, uh, the anthropology of uncovering what they were interested in. That's so cool. Oh no, I've accidentally opened the door for the entire game, or the entire stream to just be ragging on names and tales of Arise. <laughs> How do I unring the bell? Help me. I don't have anything to sell right now, and I think, oh well, no, I know, I already burned all my gold, so I think we're going to be happy for the moment because we have to be. I only have 14 life bottles. Yeah, we can make that work. He says with no confidence in his voice. Tempus Eternum. Eternal time, I imagine. That must be Latin. That sounds Latin. What is this? It appears to be moving. <laughs> a clock? Mm, maybe not. Pottery or widely turning anything I say into like a Vespi this. reference. Its presence suggests that a great many people did inhabit this location at one time. And now it's all lonely and stuff. Huh? Machines were built for humans to use. So now this one has no purpose. It's totally sad. I'd expect you to say that. I wouldn't go so far as to say machines have souls, but still. Your sentiment does have a point. Even that, notice Pascal leaning into the idea of machines and objects having a purpose, a telos. And again, it's like if you didn't have that layer of looking into what telos meant, the name telos estway would sound like pure nonsense to you. It doesn't have to. It sounds like that might even be the case for um, Helgol Ryugola 67 based on the uh, unpacking the grail is trying to do. But see, that's what I'm saying, especially in the tail series. You look around, you turn over that rock. I'll bet you'll find something. Whether or not you're satisfied with what you find. Now, that, that's a separate question. <laughs> One question at a time. That's what I just said. <laughs> you can't object to what I'm saying at the same time that I'm saying that same thing. It's dirty pool potter, even for you. Hey, Chrissy, welcome back. Good to see you. How have you been? Oh, I'm sure the Lambda Males conversation will be back, though. Warning, warning. Monsters, Lambda, just -ness. Alert phase from 8 to 9. 
Oh, I wonder if that's supposed to suggest that Lambda was something that was not conscious, that gained consciousness? You have my attention. Nah, I'm playing. Grace always has my attention. Oh, Chrissy, that sounds like such a deliciously serendipitous occasion. I'm so glad that you were able to have that for yourself. I hope it was a shot in the arm of confidence. I, uh, I know you'd been in the academic doldrums a little bit, and God knows you deserve to feel good about everything you've been working on. I got your email, by the way, since you happen to be on the stream. So I am I am very excited to dig into that uh, blog draft that you sent me. I'm really excited about that. Emerald, we're now working together. <laughs> there you go. Nothing like an excuse to crack a beer found in the wild. Oh. I would pour one out with y'all, except uh, all the beers I have are are sequestered for uh, for when Matt comes and we're going to have a little holiday hangout about it. But I'm sure that'll find its way onto the stream when he's here. Natto, a goopy, ropey delicacy. That's an acquired taste, I'll bet. You can smell its stench from three leagues away. Oh my goodness. Still rancid after all these years. Oh, and Malik got a title, The World Seeker. Excellent. Well, let's look at that before we go further, since we're so down the rabbit hole about titles. World Seeker. World Seeker! Proof of a discoverer who has seen the globe. Keep the dream alive. I love that. Yeah, I would say you definitely deserved it, Chrissy. No doubt about that. That's true. Or the cosmic globe that, you know, covers all globes at once. Something must be rotting. I'll never get this out of my clothes. Ooh, yum. Somebody's fermenting soybeans. Soybeans? Why? You can make all kinds of goodies out of soybeans if you vary the fermentation level. Fermentation level? Yeah, it's a lot easier than you think it is. All it really boils down to is the amount of time you spend fermenting them. So are you saying these soybeans are going to become something else? Maybe. We should try some and see. Pascal, how can you tolerate this smell without holding your nose? I like this smell. <laughs> how could... Uh, oh. oh, Pascal, I love you. So unabashedly you. Actually, I just got some uh, some new coffee beans in the mail today. Uh, and I think uh, the ones that I was brewing today are a special um, yeast fermentation process um, from a, a, uh, a producer out of China. So I'm very excited to try that. It smelled amazing while I was brewing it. So I'm hopeful that I'm in for some good coffee. I'm a huge coffee nerd. If that hasn't come up on the stream before, I don't, I don't remember whether I ever said that. But I'm a, yeah, I'm a psycho when it comes to coffee. Yes, Chrissy, TLDR, and I'm sure it will come up again. Uh, we've been celebrating how uh, every time you hear a name that sounds weird and obscure uh, in a Tales game, chances are pretty good that they have thought a lot about its thematic resonance with the rest of the game and are offering it as a cipher uh, and a way into thinking about the other elements of the game. And so we were playing that exercise with Lambda and Protos Haze amongst names from other games. Very well, let's begin. Why does my camera keep getting fucked? There we go. Oh, 
<laughs> I was smiling also because, like I said, my buddies are going to be joining me um, probably starting this coming Friday on the stream. And it's so wonderfully late game that it's going to be such a Herculean feat to explain any amount of it to them in a way that they actually understand what's going on. <laughs> I'm I'm actually cautiously hopeful that we can at least roll credits on the main part of the game before they get here because I feel like it would be all the more overwhelming to them if they dropped in only to fight the final boss in a game that they hadn't played. But uh, we'll see. It'll be an interesting matter of timing, especially given how close we are to the end of this point. The end of Act 3, I should say. Good job, Asbo. You were minimally useful. That, that is an interesting point, Grail. I do feel the pull of that. I think part of what is interesting about this game is that it anchors its core main plot to relatively few um, relationships and interactions, which is maybe another part of why it feels and plays differently than a lot of other JRPG plots. I would say that's at least part of what makes it feel different to me in a really cool and interesting way. Whereas there are definitely some JRPGs where you just, you need to explain all of the technical jargon and history of the world and this, that, and the other in order to get it at all. And I do feel the pull of that maybe not being the case in Grace's. This is the humanoid research center? All the more interesting though, because that makes me almost put it um, in a group with stuff like Tales of Zestiria, where a lot of it feels superficial if you're just thinking about the main motions of the plot. But part of the magic of it is that so many complicated themes emerge from the nuances of the relationships between everything that's in the foreground and background of those events. So it's like, yeah, I, I can explain to you the basics of the plot in like three minutes. And if you have three hours, I'll tell you what it's actually about. I will warn you again. If you value your lives, please use extreme caution while inside this facility. Yes, that's exactly what I had in mind, Pottery. Yeah, which is interesting. I would say that puts it in the minority amongst Tales games. I just hope their machines still work so we can help Sophie. Come on, let's get inside and see. Like even, I remember, um, I think the hardest one for me was when poor Dan sat in on like the, like, I think it was late second act uh, into like to just before the third act of Dawn of the New World, and it was like, okay, here's what you want to know about who's who, who thinks who is who, like how that came to be from the aftermath of this other game with these other worlds. Oh my god, we uh, we needed a minute. So quiet. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair All point, Chrissy. Is my heartbeat, but I'm still alive. Trust will only betray. Definitely tough with the sequel, yeah. Hope will only disappoint. We must remove all hope and return it to the planet. To the planet's soul, Lambda. Hmm. That also strikes an Eternian core with me. I was gonna say it reminds me of the ending of Final Fantasy IX, but the part of Final Fantasy IX that it reminds me about also resonates with Tales of Eternia, so why not use the <laughs> Tales reference? I love this track, by the way, this is great. <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, Richard is so Lambda that he doesn't need anyone except for himself. Literally. Yeah, that's an interesting wondering, Pottery. Do you have any ideas about that? Or I would also put it to you, Grail, because I know you're such an active creative writer. Whereas I have probably not done a whit of creative writing since high school. Then I was a very active creative writer, but now I'm much more in the analytical corner of the world, as you all know. Oh, really? So this is your um, Toa's Valley Mine, because that was exactly what happened to me in Tales of Symphonia when I was that age. That makes me feel so seen, Grail, that we had like deeply parallel experiences in different Tales games. Well, we both had the same arc, so I would say that's a good thing in terms of where we ended up. Maybe that's part of it, too, because, I mean, like, for me, I know, uh, like, having such a hard time in the first place kind of gave me a bit of a chip on my shoulder for really wanting to try to figure it out, and so here I am still trying to figure out these games after all these years. Hi, Noctilus. Nice to see you. Yes, it is. Oh, is that your next adventure, Chrissy? Yeah, Pottery, the, the time constraint sounds compelling. I'm also really drawn by what you say in terms of everyone's line for something being over edgy, being different, because I, I think there's a lot of truth to that in terms of even, I would even go so far as to say people see different things as edgy in a lot of cases. I don't, I don't at least hear it as one of those well-defined experiences that we all just categorically agree on. And I also feel like um, like we had some decent moments of this with Dawn of the New World and, uh, and also with Tales of Berseria. Like I think there are some moments where if you just find yourself looking at them out of context, whether that's you know, looking at a scene in a game you're not deeply invested in, or even just if you've been tuning out in a game for a while and suddenly you tune in during a cutscene, I think some things can seem edgy uh, just because of like the words that are used or the tone of voice that's expressed, whereas if you're really deeply invested and engaged in the world, it can feel more authentic uh, and like less of a, a departure from the norm. Not in all cases, but I feel that sometimes, especially with JRPGs. Where, like, if you, especially, I get this when I talk to people who don't play a lot of JRPGs and they talk about the things that hold them back from engaging with them. Um, and a lot of times it's stuff like the ways in which the tropes lean towards edginess or stuff that doesn't make them comfortable. And it's like, I think those things can just feel so different when you're outside of the world versus inside of it. Headspace matters. That is, that's a, another way of pointing to what I was saying about edginess. Yeah, and sometimes I feel like when you're trying to represent concepts or use your characters in overtly symbolic or allegorical ways, then their dialogue can come off as non-natural in a way that can sometimes feel stilted or edgy if you're not really following it in terms of the symbolism and you're trying to just see them as representations of real people. So especially with JRPGs that are so oftentimes concerned with um, pretty overt symbolism in terms of how they approach their storytelling, that could also be part of the challenge. And 
imagine we're probably gonna need another charged battery going down here. I will say though, some of my most fun and quotable lines are things that I genuinely love, but also I love quoting them out of context because they sound very edgy. For instance, this is not from a Tales game. Give it to me, your dark soul. <laughs> I love that line. I think it's perfect. I think the Ring City is one of the coolest DLCs ever created to date, but saying that to someone out of context is just so delightfully silly. The first and final slave night, my beloved. is quite distinctive. It's a Stratton military secret. I can't speak of it. Oh, I've got it mostly figured out. Huh? But you... Man, you sure love getting flustered. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. <laughs> I love everything about that name. I'm gonna need a full copy of that speech. I'm going to have to read it aloud for everyone. <laughs> See, that's one thing that is like, <laughs> you guys sometimes talk about putting your Aaron hats on. I'm going to put my Grail hat on. I think one thing that I've come to appreciate working through these streams is just how richly the comedic and silly elements can contribute to the overall nuanced like portrait of the story. And I do think that sometimes like, for me, especially nowadays, part of it can be the fun of leaning into the edginess. And that doesn't take away from how serious or trenchant or philosophically interesting a game is. That just adds another layer to why it can be fun to play. And there's nothing wrong or, or simple about that. That can be a ritually rewarding experience in itself. This unit looks like it's still functional. Ooh, let me see. Yep, still ticking. You know a lot about these things, little bro? I studied them extensively in military school, among other subjects. I had to be at the top of my class. I didn't expect to get Hubert backstory in here of all places. I assumed it would be the brooch that Sophie had been looking for a thousand years ago. Is that because you had to represent for the glasses wearing crowd? Yeah, you got it in one. Are you seriously making jokes about my eyewear? No, it's because I considered being anything other than number one was utterly meaningless. Although, yeah, when I think about it now, it's almost funny. What is? At first, I worked hard to please my adoptive father. Later, it was to get back at Lant. Because they sent you off to be adopted? Exactly. I struggled to accept the truth of my adoption at first. That I, I am so outside of DMC, but that definitely tracks with what I've heard of its reputation, Pottery, absolutely. But once I did, I was furious at Lant and my father. They were all I could think about. Huh, it's like they say, mother is the necessity of invention. <laughs> oh, that's one of those Pascal moments that I echoed in my, uh, my light years gaff at the start of the, at the, start of the stream. Uh, yes, however, I'm not quite sure that applies here. Although I admit to being quite shocked when I came back to Lant. How come? Once I came into power, I saw just how difficult my father's job was. Lot's political position has always been quite precarious, after all. So why didn't you quit? Honestly, I don't know. I guess I wanted to prove to the world that I could do the job. So you could have revenge and stuff. I don't think that was it. And I don't think it was because Lot was my hometown, or that it was an important strategic point for Strata. I think I was just testing my own heart. Hmm, maybe it's something even more basic than that. Like what? <laughs> I can't tell you, that would totally ruin it. <laughs> Why is that? You'll understand in time, don't worry about it. If you say so. 
Oh, the drive unit, another request item. Oh, that was really cool. And so neat to see also um, on the back end of that amazing side quest where Asbel and Hubert got to read their father's diary when their mother shared it with them, because we really see these different windows into different aspects of Hubert that we might have reduced to a single drive of his to try to figure out who he was in relation to his homeland. But the game is actually showing us, no, it's more multifaceted than that. He's trying to figure out who he is, and that has to do with orienting himself relative to his family, his new family, his old dad, his old home, his whatever it means for him to be something like a governor, whether as the, the son of the Lord of Lant or as someone with position in the Stratton military. It's really cool to see how just progressively through side quests they're um, showing us how much of an onion that is by peeling the layers back. It's a good question, Pottery. Do you, I totally skipped past the title actually, which is very unlike me. Um, Lover of Lant, is that it? Which is also a... Uh, Oh, okay. I thought the cat icon was for costumes. I was misled. These feelings support his very being. Logic plays no part in the equation. Yeah, especially for someone like Hubert, who has grown into such a tactician, that idea of trying to get down to really the essence of his heart and something that's pre-rational um, or proto-rational, if you prefer. Really interesting to see him um, plumbing his own depths like that. Boo, no, it's much more rich and explicit than that, Grail. <laughs> you can't be flippant about these titles. These titles are deep. <laughs> Dialogue is such a challenging skill, Grail. I, uh, back when I did plays, I mostly worked in allegory, and I think part of that was because naturalistic dialogue was so hard for me, so I, I got to give it up to you for that, Mad Props. Great point, Pottery. Yep. Yep, through the title, we get an understanding of Hubert that he himself is still wrestling with. Fucking love that. Yeah, I think I'm going to end up writing a whole feature length study on titles in the series, and I think Graces is going to be a centerpiece, if not the centerpiece in that. I can't see another outcome at this point. <laughs> not, not even ropers, alien ropers! That's so much worse for some reason. <laughs> Stop it, ropers, please! I have a family! <laughs> what a terrible placement for the healing circle! <laughs> I'm gonna make a quick note of where we had this conversation in the stream. Yeah, definitely, because it's such a huge presence in all of the games, but in such different ways, with such different approaches. It'd be a really fun way to think about the overall series in a, in a way that uh, I really haven't done in any of my written works yet. In part because it's daunting, in part because it's also kind of a fool's errand to do that before I get deep enough into my plays and replays of the series, but now I think we're approaching that sweet spot when it's, uh, it's warranted to start looking more broadly at the overall series. Shadow Roper, that's what it's called. Oh, that's even worse than Alien Roper. <laughs> it's because the button that switches the camera is the target button, and so I usually go to the pause menu from trying to use that, because that's what I was trying to look at. 
Oh, don't tell me that. Now I have to wait until we do Zillia and Zillia 2. Ah! You're saying we have to work through the whole series until we talk about the whole series? <laughs> ah, no, I'm kidding. That's what makes it fun. And also, I've been, I've been meaning and hoping to eventually do um, multiple articles concerned with similar ideas, perhaps across different games, perhaps revisiting the same game. And so having something on titles as they stand in Graces and some of the other games is just a great frame of reference uh, through which to engage with something like Zillia. So, so much the better. Has the amount of gold you earn, but restores a proportional amount of LF. I don't know if I like that one. I feel like we're oftentimes just scraping by with the amount of gold we have. That makes a lot of sense to me, Grail, and I know you have a second message, but yeah, that idea of being able to imagine your way into your characters and then just ask yourself, well, what would I say in this situation? That strikes me as a really wonderful way into it. Oh my god, I can't believe you only just shared that with me, Pottery. I, yeah, you better believe I appreciate that. I just got my John Avon secret lair in the mail yesterday. Are you kidding me? Well, if you still have those or you have photos, I hope you might consider sending them along to me because I would love to, uh, to see what you came up with. That's so neat to me on so many levels. Talk about a great way of, of breathing your own special kind of life um, into a series that you love through a game that you love. That's so cool. It's awesome just for the story. That's such a cool story. I wish I remained more artistically inclined. I, as a kid, I really was. Um, and now I'm just not, I guess I'm just, I channel more of that into the analytical work, so. I, I guess you could say that the articles I publish are kind of my equivalent of, of fan MTG cards of these games in my way. But yeah, stuff like fan fiction and fan representations well. of the media you love is, is such a special way of interrogating your relationship with it from the <laughs> That already puts you ahead of the cartographers in this game, Grail, as we've talked about. <laughs> But Grail, I, I would challenge that description of your current project because I understand why that would make it hard, but that also sounds to me like it's an awesome opportunity for growth, not just in terms of your storytelling abilities, but also just in terms of your ability to like empathize with other people, right? Because it sounds like, especially given the way in which you think about storytelling, that's what you're doing. You're imagining yourself into different perspectives. So especially creating this representation that is so unlike you and then challenging yourself to do that. I, I bet that would foster some really cool development in just the way in which you engage with others more broadly. Not that you need to develop those skills as if you're underdeveloped, but just as an exercise that we could all benefit from. I think that's really cool. Oh, right on hand. That is surprising, but you better believe I'm going to open that right now. <laughs> it warned me for erotic and adult imagery. Oh, these are great, and you made so many! And you thought so much about their abilities and color identity and everything? Wow. Did you, you didn't make art for them or is the art just not rendering for me? I'm gonna have to spend some time sitting with those and appreciating them. That's awesome. I think I did this already, right? Yep. And back we go. Yeah. 
Yeah, and what a cool game design exercise, too. The question of saying, all right, given what these characters contribute as sets of abilities and moves for players in this one rule set and this one game format, how can we authentically translate those characters into a set of abilities uh, for a player in a very different rule set and game format? That's super cool. Now I'm going to guess, this may be a fool's errand, but if I know Tails Dungeons, I'm going to guess that they're going to want us to have a charged battery on the next floor too, so I think it's going to be worth our time to go back up and get one before we go down there. I can see why this dungeon would be frustrating to an eight or nine year old Grail, by the way. I think had I not just gone through all of the dungeons that we did in especially Berseria and Zisteria, like I, I would be more lost right now than I am. we go all right and down <laughs> I feel like you should almost like yeah try to find a um, like a game developer to work with or something Grail because you obviously have such a rich background in the tail series and in fighting games and you know, if it were developed by someone with, with an eye for it, and in the way that we were talking about with uh, with Pottery's Magic Cards being authentic to both the fighting game format and to the Tales series, like a Smash Bros. for Tales or something, I would play the crap out of that. I feel like that would be so much fun. sound like a lot of fun pottery. Man, and you know, now I'm frustrated because nowadays with the way Magic is treating all of its universes beyond nonsense, they're actually in a position uh, in terms of their own marketing efforts and design philosophy to make sets like that, which is so cool, but also so frustrating because we know that Tails is so below the radar that they would never consider that. Uh, but at least we can have the fan-made celebrations of those things. No, the first few I read, I mean, they seemed like they would be perfectly reasonable and logical in the magic deck. I would love to have a game of Commander focused on different games or heroes versus villains, stuff like that. That'd be so much fun. <laughs> Give me my Van Destelka grants Commander and we shall reshape the board in our image. Rare Scabbard, created from a new type of metal that was recently uncovered by earthquakes. Oh, the rare metal that we found. Um, back on Ephin Ephinia. Ephinia, there we go. All right, took me a minute to get the pronunciation, but I think I am getting that hardwired now. Fabulous. I'd be shocked and insulted if you weren't in there, Pottery, but you know me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Duke would be so fun as a way of just um, cloning the abilities of whoever he's fighting against. Channeling the spirit of a Lucifer. Being sad. Not an over limit, Shadow Roper! What a scary combination of words. Yeah, 
I'm just thinking in terms of Smash Bros now, and I feel like Duke would be like, like Kirby, but a JRPG character. <laughs> Which is, uh, I, I never expected to be making a comparison between Duke and Kirby, but here we are. Save point already. Felt like we were gonna have to drive a few more floors down. Or is it just a halfway point? Enemies! I know I've said this before, but I feel like the biggest man in the world. I nail a perfect dodge and get a million CC back. <laughs> and then I feel like the smallest man in the world <laughs> when the Roper slap me as I try to dodge. So it all averages out, I suppose. My real life with guys who can code is that they love being paid for projects though, as opposed to working on passion projects. So I, mean, I think that's a double-edged sword, but you know, if it's something that you really love and over time can even put aside a little to invest in, I, uh, I'm confident you could find the right Tails fan who is also a dev who would be willing to work with you on it. I, I would be shocked if that weren't the case. I'm sure you could even just uh, like like ask the subreddit and people would come crawling out of the woodwork or something like that. That's my intuition at least. My experience of Reddit is mostly through the lens of having conversations about stuff and, and sharing my work to feed conversations about things, so I, uh, that's just my intuition. But I feel like the community can be good for those community source things. <laughs> that does happen sometimes. It's never too late to expand your circle, though. Or just have different circles for different things. This looks just like that machine from the ruins beneath Wallbridge. This device preserves visual recordings of research targets. Copies their data. <laughs> kind of like Melchior did with the Siegfried. Lambda. Oh, hey, there's that word again. <laughs> yeah, I think that is the sweet spot, Padre. But also like finding a unicorn because I feel like most people who know how to code, that also becomes the, you know, their their greatest earning potential and so they just do that for their job by default. What does it mean anyway? Lambda. In our world, lambda has come to mean nightmare. Oh, that's interesting, too, because for all of the um, variable semiotics of lambda in the real world, I forgot that we get a literal definition of it um, in terms of how it's used here. Why is that? Because he sucks! Lambda is a life form we discovered by accident while researching the Lostalia. When the Institute's director, Professor Cornell, began to study it, it quickly became a nightmare for us all. The worst aspect of Lambda, and there are many, is an ability to hatch monsters from its body. Hmm. These monsters threw Fodra into chaos and eventually led to its destruction. That cocoon! It looks just like the one that appeared at World's Eye. 
After wreaking havoc here, Lambda fled to your world of Athenia. I was thinking the same thing, Grail. I was kind of surprised that she wasn't, actually. Although she did just wake up from, what, a thousand year snooze, so I guess it's fair to not deploy her into combat right away. Oh, those playing cards are awesome. I would 1,000% buy a set of those. Oh, and Muse the Joker? Fucking awesome. <laughs> oh. Tails fans are the best fans, I'll tell you. We knew Lambda had to be stopped, so we created a humanoid capable of fighting it and initiated pursuit. That humanoid is Protos Hase, the one you call Sophie. Unfortunately, Protos Hase was unable to destroy Lambda. After much discussion, we surviving Fodrans chose to seal off Athenia in the hopes of containing Lambda there. But now, after so many years, the Athenians have come to us. So you built Sophie and then sent her to our world so she could defeat Lambda. Does that mean Lambda is the one who created the cocoon? But wait, that doesn't make sense. I mean, Richard made the cocoon, right? Maybe Lambda knows how to disguise itself or something. Maybe it just looks like Richard. I refuse to believe that Richard and Lambda are the same. I know Richard. He's not a monster. He can't be. So this is interesting. That line of Asbel's, I refuse to believe that Richard and Lambda are the same. Um... If you think back to last stream, it's it's not as easy to appreciate this because I cut the stream in between the conversations, but very recent to this conversation is the one that Asbel had with Emerod when she was referring to Sophie as this non-human organism that had been engineered for a specific purpose. And Asbel said, I don't care about that. Sophie is Sophie. And so the way he's using very similar affirmations and locutions to navigate his relationship and understanding of Sophie and Richard um, strikes me as a really cool and, and probably intentional parallelism. Sophie's getting worse. We must hurry. I agree. Come on. Well, this is one of the interesting things, too. I mean, this game, like all of the Tales games, plays so much with perspective. And while we still don't know really what's going on with Richard and Lambda, we certainly understand enough to know that... I didn't mean to start a cutscene. I was, I was clumsy. Um, we know enough to understand that there's something fishy happening with Richard where there's some kind of undue influence on him. But if you think back to all of the windows we've seen into Richard going around the world, those have all been just from our perspective as the player. There's no reason that the characters in this party would have that understanding that Richard is wrestling with something foreign inside of himself. And so they're kind of, they're forced to confront an apparent truth um, that they don't really have the evidence to negotiate in one way or another. And so to watch them do that while we have a different perspective, I think is what colors this in a really interesting way. Yeah, I think parasite is a really good word for it, Chrissy. But interesting too, because notice um, Emerod said that they discovered um, Lambda in the, the core of the world of Aphinia. Um, that's what Listalia is. It's the, it's the literal heart of the world where its energy emanates from. So again, we don't know that much at this point, but it raises the question, well, is Lambda really the parasite? Is Lambda a foreign presence or is Lambda really like the most native presence to the world? We don't know enough to answer that right now, but I'm sure we'll find out more as we go on. What's happening? Protos Hase's particles are breaking down. Excuse me? Oh man, this is like Tales of the Abyss. Protos Hase is composed of individual particles that act in concert with each other. I don't think I noticed that comparison when I first played this. These particles, tinier than a grain of sand, come together to form a human shape. And while they act as one, the particles also possess the ability to separate from each other, which is what you see happening right now. Wow, I totally forgot about this. 
Jazz Bell. Sheria, what's happening? Uh, hey, what's going on, you guys? It's the result of a process called distributive preservation. Your friends must be completely synchronized with Protos Hase's particles. I don't understand. When Protos Haste suffers heavy damage, it usually splits into individual particles, shuts down all functionality, and begins the process of reconstruction. This is known as particle preservation. Uh. Distributive preservation, on the other hand, allows Protos Haste to implant its particles into one or more separate vessels. Have you ever seen Protos Haste split into particles like this? Anyone? It's like resonance in Tales of the Abyss. Seven years ago. Not the same, but <laughs> one might say that this resonates with the concept of resonance in Tales of the Abyss. And let that be my one dad joke on a Friday night. But the unit shouldn't actually engage that procedure. The reason being, distributed preservation makes it much more difficult for the particles to reform. Failure could render reformation impossible. So why would Protos Haste have risked entering that state? Would her particles have any kind of effect on the vessels that they went into? Yes. In fact, while the particles prepare for reconstruction, they would repair any damaged areas of the vessel as well. Mm. So Sophie split herself into three parts and then used those parts to save Asbel, Sheria, and little bro! But then that means... Sophie didn't die after all. She was just... recuperating within us. I have another thought like that too, Pottery, so yeah, put a pin in that. She's been with us this whole time. I see. Then this would explain why we possess some of the same powers she has. Incredible. So, what would happen if she underwent distributive preservation again in her current condition? Distributive preservation does not allow for reconstruction of the self. She would lose all elements of her current identity. Sophie, you risked your life for us. Impossible. Protos Haste was never designed for this kind of self-sacrifice. I fear further particle breakdown could be disastrous. We must hurry. Yeah, I am um, host of the light. All right, well, first, I mean, first, what a great scene, but Second first, let's look at the title that Asbel just got, and then we can talk about this for a second before we roll on. What a cool scene. The life he once thought was lost had actually been inside of him for the past seven years. And what to, to the points that Pottery and Chrissy were both making, what beautiful poetry, to use that word we used earlier, to emerge out of something that is deeply metaphysically grounded and explained um, in the ecosystem of this world uh, in the way that we just saw. That is awesome. That to me is such a cool example of one of those classic to the point of cliched late stage JRPG explain something that's been in the ether for a long time scenes. Um, that actually has deep resonance on so many different levels with the story. And to be honest, the kind of scene that makes me want to dust off all of my old philosophy of quantum mechanics readings, because I, I, I do think this is the kind of game that would reward trying to read into the way in which it's thinking about particle relationships um, and the scientific aspects of the world. I think just between stuff like the naming of Lambda and the Amarcians and the particle physics of Sophie and the way she distributes uh, and reconstitutes herself. I think there's just, there's too much there to overlook that aspect of the world design uh, without thereby overlooking an aspect of the story, I would say. But yeah, I think it's, it's such a beautiful way of explaining in terms of the mechanics of the world 
this metaphor for not just the nature of friendship, um, which it certainly does, as you were saying, Chrissy, um, and not just the nation of how we, uh, excuse me, not just the nature of how we synthesize um, aspects of our own identity from the people around us, uh, which it certainly is, as you say, Pottery. Um, but I also think one of the things that really strikes me about it is a nice button on what we've been talking about for the last several streams in terms of these different networks of relationships that create and circumscribe certain contexts for us such that, um, as I'd been saying in a few of the side quests, like there are only certain contexts in which it's meaningful for us to talk about certain aspects of ourselves um, at all. Right? Like there's a sense in which it would almost be senseless for Malik to bring up his past in Fendel with the party because they just have no access to that aspect of him. And I think what's cool about that idea of distributive identity, um, to use the metaphor that attaches to the metaphysics of what Emerod was talking about with Sophie, is I think there's a sense in which like there, there is a metaphysically robust sense in which we're not just seeing these characters as individuals of Asbel and Sharia and Hubert and Sophie, but we're actually seeing this kind of single unit of the relationship because they're distributed across each other. Um, the idea that the commingling of particles actually creates this kind of single synthetic unit of all of them. And so it's like even your individual um, like physical nature is insufficient to adequately describe who you are because part of what your identity consists in is this network of relationships within which you're embedded. I think that's really deeply powerful, not even in terms of just what Tales of Graces is wrestling with, but also in the broader context um, just what it is to think about party-based storytelling in JRPGs like the Tales series. Because if you think about it, what do we do when we pick up these games and play it? Yeah, we invest in one character and another character, and we're all stoked to dig into the backstory of someone like Malik as an individual. But also the thing that grounds the progression of the main story is the interest and the goals and the activity of this party this networked character unit, uh, which is constituted by all of these, and yet, you know, without which, all, all of these characters lose key aspects of their meaning and their identity. Couple that then with what we were talking about in terms of the meaning of death and rebirth and everything that Sophie was, in a, in a deep spiritual sense, suffering with after she was reconstituted on Lont Hill. And you get something that, while emerging from very foundational physics ideas and scientific thought, is also deeply, deeply Buddhist. This idea that all we are in the world is this representation of connections and relationships between different things. And yet, what we are at the end of the day is something that must transcend any of those physical networks of relationships uh, and become something more ethereal uh, and essential to the point that you look within it and find that without any of those connections, there is no self and you've arrived at the, at the heart of Buddhism, right? Um, so I think that is such a cool way to give some more um, textual grounding to a lot of the themes that we've already been wrestling with because they've been in the game all along. And it's got me very stoked to see where we go next uh, on this adventure as we get more of this unwound. Pottery, super great question. Um, my super dodgy answer is I feel like it's deeply contextual, um, but I do. I think that it can be really, really nice to have a what I would say is a clear and tight scene like that where you get all the explanation you need to to see not only how all of the different elements in that scene are working, like the particles, but also a pretty clear line of inference to how that ties into the themes of the game, like we've just been tracing out over the last few minutes. But I also think like 
if a game's text, and, and I mean text in the abstract literary nature of it, not just all of its literal words, if its text is sufficiently coherent uh, and coordinated around particular themes, I think oftentimes a lot of the fun and the magic of literary analysis can be looking at the different elements of it and in ways that are maybe not tight in terms of explicitly pointing out a metaphor, seeing how these different aspects can actually be read metaphorically and symbolically, which may in fact be a different activity, right? Because it is much more of like superimposing a level of interpretation rather than drawing out a metaphor that is being presented to you explicitly. So perhaps a little like the distinction between explicit meaning and implicit meaning in terms of what a text offers versus what you take from it, maybe slightly different. Um, but I think, yeah, to me, it comes down to a matter of the activity with which you're concerned. And I think if you're trying to get something like explicit meaning out of something that you're, um, you're drawing inferentially from stuff that's beyond the game's text, then you're going to be disappointed in the way that you are when you kind of try to fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, not to say that either is, is better or has priority over the other. In my view, that's what I would say. Oh, I didn't even, thank you, Grail. I didn't even clock that Emerald was in the party. Oh yeah, um, can we see her status? No. She's just there as a, um, as an escort. Like, uh, like the example I mentioned of Archie when she's possessed by her friend whose name I can't remember in Tales of Fantasia, that same setup. Uh, there's a discovery point. Old toy blocks. Oh. Break my heart into a thousand pieces. Toy blocks? What are those doing here? Interesting. Cornell used those as part of his research. Cornell? Was he related to this facility? Correct. Cornell was a foremost researcher of humanoid development, a key mind in the field of biotechnology. Um, is this Cornell person still alive? I'm afraid not. From my understanding, Cornell died before the Great War began in Fodra. However, his research lived on, and was the foundation for many spectacular breakthroughs. It truly is a shame that such an accomplished individual such as he would lead such a short-lived life. Asbel, Sharia, we should move on. Yes, of course. I think, Pottery, that is a good question for us to keep in mind as we learn more about the origins of Sophie and what's at stake in the conflict between Protos Haste and Lambda. And what I would say is, at first pass based on where we are now, um, I think, yeah, we'll put, we'll put a pin in the Cornell stuff because I'm sure that will come up again. In terms of Sophie though, I, I think this is actually a great case of where the rubber meets the road in terms of what we've been saying about this game's philosophy of different descriptions of people and places in terms of various titles and how they want to be described because i think that to me as much as anything else grounds uh, and gives us the license to think about potential different interpretations of that scene and that particle representation uh, without one having priority over the other or being decisive so i think to me, I see that scene and it, it kind of says, I think, both of the things that we're wrestling with right now. One is, I, I think, as I've been saying, it strikes me as a pretty tight metaphor for the kind of interconnectivity of relationships um, and delineation of relationships through the bonds between people, whether that's Sophie in particular or anyone in this party maybe extend that to anyone in the world, um, probably, but I, I think the party is certainly our focal point for that. But I also think, exactly as you point out, Pottery, it does say something significant about Sophie, because we don't want to erase all of the differences between the characters either, and as we've been saying from the beginning, there are certainly a lot of attributes to Sophie that are distinctive of her. Now, one thing that we've also been saying from the beginning is that when we see Sophie wrestling with things like 
rebirth and the meaning of her death and trying to make sense of a purpose that she doesn't want to remember relative to who she is. Sophie, to me, from the beginning of the game, has seemed like a very explicit and kind of sci-fi metaphor for just the struggles that we all go through in life as we try to make sense of our identity through different time slices, uh, as different parts of ourselves die or are reconfigured. And so I think there is a sense in the game where even as she's different, we can see her as kind of a key or a cipher to what everyone goes through. But I think in terms of her as a character, there's also a sense in which part of what makes her distinctive is this idea that, as she said from the beginning, she's a protector. Part of why she did what she did, which, as Emerald said, was not kind of in her DNA or programming, was that she had this special bond with these people and she took it upon herself to protect them. And that was kind of a singular directional uh, relationship. It wasn't as if they were all protecting each other in a nexus. It was Sophie doing something for the sake of all of them. Now, I think we can take that same action, the idea of taking it upon oneself to have a unique impact on the network that's connected to one and extend that to the other characters. But I think the utility of that metaphor and symbolism also comes from having a particular attention to what Sophie means as unique relative to the other party members. So what I would say, long story short, is I think it's important to see the scene through the unique lens of Sophie, but seeing Sophie on her own terms then allows us to see and use her as a symbol for what's going on with the other party members uh, and perhaps what the game is saying about a lot of these concepts more broadly. That would be my take on it. Oh, I hate rooms with multiple exits because I don't want to miss anything. Let's check this one first. Okay, this was the way we came into this room. Let's look at the other exit points. Oh, actually, since we just went through all of that, I'll save too. I imagine we won't need to come back to the save file, but that's a good place to tag up. Okay, there's more floor on the side. And what about the bottom way? Is that the... Oh, there is no bottom way. I thought there was a bottom way. <laughs> Joke's on you, I already uploaded it to the Amarcian image processor and immortalizer that is YouTube videos on demand, so you can't escape it. <laughs> it's ingrained in our collective history forever and in our enmeshed network of relationships. It's a good question, Pottery. Um, and I think, I think there are a few different kinds of answers I would give. First, I, I echo your sentiment that I think at the end of the day, there's not any really right or wrong answer to give. I think it's more a question of what are you as an analyst and a gamer trying to achieve with your inquiry? And what do you think is the soundest way of going about that? So I would encourage all of you to think about that. And you know, whether it's you Pottery or you Grail or Chrissy, if you're still hanging out, um, as you think about the meaning that you try to derive from games, how would you answer Pottery's question? You know, how do you figure out what it is in a game or an artwork that you want to attend to and what it is that you leave outside your focus? Because it's a very complex question um, with a whole network of interrelated considerations. 
Another answer I would give is, you know, we've talked on the stream before about the fun of seeing each other's approaches through each other's eyes. So I would honestly also ask all of you, you know, how do you think that I go about this stuff? Because part of how I've been trying to run these live book clubs is by really trying to talk through and think through out loud the kind of considerations that I would be thinking about just on my own when I play these games. And so my hope is that at least to some extent, my thought process has kind of been laid bare for you just through the sorts of inquiries that we've been doing. But that's not to say I'm going to be coy about it. I will also happily give you my own answer, which is basically what I've been trying to do in games like Tales of Graces is I oftentimes find myself entering into the interpretation of a text through just the lens of trying to answer questions about or puzzles within my own experience with it. And that can mean a whole range of things. I can find myself saying, man, you know, that particular boss that the game had me kill, that battle just sat really weird with me. It didn't feel quite right. And I want to understand why that is. And so then as I go through the game, I try to find things that seem salient as clues to explaining that phenomenon or that experience that I had. This, for example, is you know, a good way of thinking about the approach to what I did with Final Fantasy IX in terms of trying to make sense of its final boss. So that's one way. The other way is that, uh, especially in JRPGs and other stories that just have the format of being very long and having many different thematic threads uh, and plot lines under consideration. For me, I oftentimes find myself wondering, oh good, we had a charged battery. I didn't think we had another one. Um, I find myself asking the question of, okay, given that I'm interested in a coherent experience, so making a single sort of meaning out of my overall time with this game, it follows that, if possible, I would like to find a single mode of interpretation that makes sense of or illuminates all these different threads that I've experienced. And so then what becomes salient is kind of looking for the different ways in which different aspects of the game, um, whether that's gameplay or particular moments in the story or attributes of the characters, can point towards and coalesce in a single unified explanation of what it is that's going on, which as you'll see, especially in the last few streams, is part of what's been going on as we've been taking threads like thinking about a character's past and the optional nature of side quests and the bonds between the characters and have slowly been trying to kind of wind them around uh, into a single uh, thread that we can then use as uh, a guidepost for orienting ourselves within the game. So those would be a few answers coming from me. <laughs> yes, Grail, what I'm saying is I trapped you in a time loop. That should be obvious at this point. I apologize if you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Chrissy, it's a fine line for me. Sometimes I feel like alcohol helps when philosophizing, and sometimes I feel like it overwhelms. I don't know if that's an aspect of the conversation, or the particular alcohol used, or just the overall amount of philosophy or alcohol, or both. <laughs> it's a fine line. Yeah, one thing which I imagine I've said on the stream before, but in case I haven't, because I think it's also pertinent here, is people who have read a lot of my work know that I am very, um, what is sometimes called death of the author about stories, which is not to say that, you know, I don't care about the author at all, or I don't think the author matters. If you've been living on the Tales of Praxis streams, I hope you just understand that's obviously not the case. I think these creators are amazing and have done so much for us, obviously. But what I do think is that for me, when it comes down to the kinds of interpretations and explanations that I'm interested in, the question of what the author literally meant or was trying to express through it 
usually has no theoretical bearing on my particular modes of inquiry, which is different from the way in which a lot of other people approach it. So I think it can be very interesting to ask the question of, okay, what's the story of how this text came to be and what was the author inspired by? Um, you know, was the creator of Final Fantasy VII, for instance, working through the death of a family member and developing the narrative as a, a work of catharsis? Turns out the answer is yes, that's interesting. That's not typically, though, the kind of analysis that I'm interested in. I'm more interested in saying, okay, looking at the object itself in terms of the different aspects of this artifact with which we're engaging, and also looking at the actual mode of engagement as one aspect of that artifact, what are the different explanations we can avail ourselves of in terms of making sense of that work as a whole in order to illuminate our own experience with it uh, and shed new light on it. Yeah, using a theme as one's guide, I find, can be very helpful, Chrissy. Once you get a, a just an inkling that a certain game is concerned with a, a certain uh, certain theme. <laughs> yeah, funny, a lot of philosophers' favorite thing is philosophizing in the pub. I know I told you my favorite story of going to a conference in England and just most of the real philosophy happening in the pub after the uh, the talks that we gave. I think back fondly on that often. Yeah, well, you know, I also think that a long-standing tradition after being done with deadlines is just allowing your brain to be scrambled for a while and reveling in that. God knows, once I'm done with this paper and have my applications in, that's part of why I'm happy about the timing of having my buddies over, because you better believe there'll be some good scrambling, probably on and off the stream, so we can all look forward to that. <laughs> I think what you're saying intuitively makes sense to me, Pottery, the difference between what the story is trying to say and what the author is trying to say. But I would love to ask you, if you don't mind, to say a little bit more, because I do feel like those are the kinds of things where people can mean very different things by them. So I'm curious in how you think about um, the difference and how that approaches the way in which you engage with these games and other works of art. One of my favorite examples of what you're talking about, Grail. Um, so one of my favorite literary theorists uh, from whom I learned a lot when I was studying literary theory and philosophy of literature in undergrad is a great classic um, thinker who I think has passed now named Wayne C. Booth. Look him up, read his work if you haven't. He's great. Um, but he talks about the concept of the death of the author, and he makes the point that um, we can tell that works and their content are distinct from what their author meant by them, because we can imagine, and there are actually like factual historical cases of this in really funny ways, of works that are meant as satire, but are so deeply and drippingly satirical that people mistake them for being like an honest representation of whatever view they're trying to parody. So you see this a lot uh, in the realm of political campaigns, right? Where imagine you're someone who's a pundit for one political party and you're trying to drag down the other one. You might publish like a pamphlet satirizing the views of the other party and trying to show everyone like, look how ridiculous these views are. But someone might pick up that text and it might seem like such a thorough endorsement of those views that they just take it to be an actual bona fide endorsement of the other party. And so uh, I always found that to be a really interesting and to me compelling case of the idea that what the author meant by work uh, is just a separate and detached question from the content and, and meaning of the work itself. But a lot of people don't think that way about works. I will say one thing, as funny as it is, and I didn't expect to be talking about Harry Potter of all things on the stream, but I, I, um, I had long been beating that death of the author drum, and then it, just in the last few years, when it started coming out, just how awful 
some of J.K. Rowling's um, biographical views are, a lot of people who wanted to salvage the meaning of Harry Potter started going down the exact same rabbit hole in order to basically try to find a theoretical basis for divorcing the meaning of those books that meant so much to them from the author and her, to many people, quite heinous views. Um, and so I, th I think that's just, it's really interesting how, I mean, it says everything that we've already said about the nature of art as being deeply personal as we think about here with these games and with a terrible fate, but it can oftentimes take those personal experiences with artworks to really be motivated to think about the theory behind it in new and different interesting ways. Tarlo X, Tarlo Cross, I never know. <laughs> I think the writers of most Sonic games were trying to say, please buy my game. <laughs> and I know that's being unfair, but I have a, a very myopic perspective on Sonic. So the best I can offer is a lighthearted troll of it. What's this? That's Tarlo X. I can't believe oh, yeah, I remember us talking about that a little time. when Hogwarts Legacy is came out, Chris. Well? I totally understand no, that. No, this is merely old junk. Hey, you're hiding something. Come on, spit it out! This is the first android I ever built. Back when I was just getting started at the Oh, we're learning more about Emerald. I never thought I'd see it again. This brings back memories. Really, Cornell should have just thrown it out. Sounds like everyone has something they're embarrassed about. Right, Tiger Festival? Ah! Uh, <laughs> I love it. When a JRPG is long enough that it can get into its own deep history. Oh, that's great. I'm excited to learn more about Emerald. I'd honestly totally forgotten about her in the story. Yeah, so it definitely seems like we're we're all on the same page in terms of the difference between what an author is trying to say versus what a text expresses. I think that's that's a great way of putting it, pottery, and it's definitely um, yeah, it's it's something that is meaningful to me as well. I think I would then still say in terms of like what a text is trying to say. Um, I would kick back in terms of the stuff that I think about um, to the distinction between like what the explicit text as written is clearly advocating for in terms of its thematic content versus what we can justify as an interpretation of it that brings in like outside arguments that inspire a reading of it beyond the text itself. Um, but again, that's not to give either one of those approaches priority. That's just to draw another distinction in the ground. Yeah, it's, it's so funny, and I totally get it. No one wants to be the first one to bring up Harry Potter, so I'm happy to be the one to break that seal. But um, yeah, I, I remember, now that you're saying that, like I'm having these, uh, these flashbacks, because back before everything started coming out about her, yeah, the, the much more innocuous stuff that she was saying that really got my danger up was all of her own like interpretation of what happened in her book saying like oh yeah this is true in the world of harry potter and this isn't true in the world of harry potter and i would be like pounding my table saying you know just because she's the author like she doesn't have any special standing to declare that interpretation as true by fiat she still has the same obligation to justify that relative to the text itself she doesn't get to continue acting as its active god after she's breathed this artifact out into the world and no one wanted to listen to me and then all the other stuff came out and then everybody wanted to listen to me. <laughs> oh, life's a fucking funny thing, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't actually know where Dan and Stefan came down on it, um, Chrissy, but just based on what I know about them and you, the idea that it's closer to home for you, certainly that sounds right to me. That would be my guess. Ask Dan about it when he's here. I'm sure he'd be happy to chat about it, and I would not be surprised if it organically came up again in one way or another. I'm amazed that there's still more to this dungeon. Oh no, how did this turn into a debate over what the great shame of the United Kingdom is? <laughs> I feel like Grail's joke was that it's the States, but <laughs> I don't know, I feel like you could go so many ways with that. Oh no, now we're out of batteries. 
So I think there's one more all the way at the top. But I think, I think if we get to the um, the last elevator, it can jump us all the way from top to bottom. And so hopefully we can get this last one without too much faff. I think that's how this works if I've been following it. Right? Yeah, and I think to me, Pottery, what you're saying about it being hard to know how to um, how to weight the metaphors you find rings true. And as a matter of just my own anecdotal experience with the analysis of games and literature, I mean, that's a huge part of why when I'm working on and writing about a game, I will go back and review cutscenes and gameplay moments and the scripts many, many times, even if it's a game that I recently played, because I think you're totally right. Um, most of the time when I'm sitting down and playing a game, especially for the first time, I'll just sit down and let my experience be my experience of it and try not to think too much about like what's the right weight to give this, because I think I completely agree with you. It can be hard to even know what interpretive lens the game seems most amenable to as you're working through it. And therefore, as you're working through it in that moment, it can be very hard to know how to interpret like the um, the narratively relevant content of what it is that you're seeing and doing, which is why it's a lot of um, going back and forth and back and forth about the um, looking at the different elements of the game and trying to square them with each other. That was a huge part of the like the legwork that I did for well that I've done for all of my Tales of Praxis articles, but why I had you know multiple monitors up looking at a bunch of different moments from all of the Xenoblade games while I was writing that book on Xenoblade Chronicles Three. It's a constant like not even bifocular process, like multiplex lens process, to use a tortured analogy from uh, from Tales of Destiny. Did I go back to the first floor? Is that where we are? No, we have to go all the way back up and then all the way back down. That's a little frustrating. Oh, wow, Grail, you were one of those who was forbidden to read or watch Harry Potter? Amazing. <laughs> Oh yeah, I remember now that you say that, Chrissy, that they posed the question in that way. And they came out on the different side of it than you did. That makes sense to me, yeah, knowing them and you. I know, I think that was the thing that was so frustrating to me. It's like, you think that you can just take up a pulpit and not even by writing another work about Harry Potter, but just by going to Twitter and, and just saying, as a matter of fact, okay, no, it was not this way, it was this way in Harry Potter. Like, that's, that's, not, that's not how texts work. That's not how authorship works. Ah, pulling my hair out. I know, I, um, I didn't realize it would be this deep a struggle grail, but I feel like we're almost done. I think there's just one more battery, right? It's in this room. Yes, all right, now we just, now we just go all the way back down. I have a feeling it'll be worth it, but this is definitely like pulling teeth. At least we have some edifying conversation to keep us company while we're doing this grunt work. So that works out at least. <laughs> Chrissy, if it makes you feel any better, I have to do that with half of the stuff that our youngster friend Grail says, so <laughs> you're not alone. It was Grail who taught me the word fizz for the first time. Or riz? Is it riz? I feel like an old man. I can't even remember the new slang. I saw it was, uh, I think, the OED's word of the year, though. So that was something I was like, ah, I know that one from Grail. Grail's keeping me educated on what all the hip kids are saying. When you say, how do we interpret the one-sided nature of the metaphor pottery, are you, like, are you talking about, 
are you kicking back to the fact that um, it was only Sophie's particles that commingled with Asbel and the rest of the gang and not Asbel and the rest of the gang's particles? Is that what you mean by the one-sidedness or are you referring to something else now? Yeah, so I think I think my settled opinion of that right now um, is what I was saying before in terms of it being like a way of adding color to what Sophie uniquely is working through as a character, but then like giving us more of a uh, more content to the nature of Sophie that can be used as a symbol for interpreting the rest of the party. So I feel like it's an interpretive two-step in that way. Um, and I think I'm thinking of that mostly in terms of situating it with uh, the themes and unifying the themes that we've been wrestling with over the last few streams. So that's my kind of unificatory bent to interpretation at work here. Very well. Let's begin. But it's also one of those things where, as I said, uh, you know, that's me working through it in the moment and what seems salient to me now, but were I to write about these themes like naming and the, like the various structures of relationships that interrelate to constitute identity um, in this game, I would certainly go back to it more than once. That's why I uh, make all these notes on the side in terms of when certain scenes happen and when we have certain points. Oh, well, I'm glad that you weren't banned from Tales, at least, Grail. That's, uh, if it had to be Tales or Harry Potter, I'm glad that you, uh, you got the access that you did. But you're still Zoomer enough, and that's what counts for this. But see, it's something that you know and you hate, so then you can also uh, you can give it to us as a new object of our own hate. And what is life if not an opportunity to accumulate as many hate humps as possible? Grumpy camels that we are. And see, to me, Chrissy, with a much less personal dog in the fight, um, I mean, that is like such an extension of what I felt was at work, even with her retconning, right? It's like, it's, it's an inability to let anyone else interpret uh, or even point out the meaning of the things that she says or the worlds that she represents. Like she wants to be the sole authority of all of it. And so when people are pointing out to her, well, you know, what you said, it's, even if that's what you meant, that is not what you said. And like, just digging in your heels about that. I mean, I th again, I'm not an expert, but I have to imagine that's at least part of how bigotry even more broadly starts, right? Unwillingness to communicate and actually like let other people participate in the meaning and understanding of your views and what it is that you express but I've been steeped in the philosophy of language for the last couple of years with Xenoblade and everything else, so maybe I have a slanted opinion of that too. Now see, it's weird. I thought that the elevators were all serving all the floors, but then it seems like they, speaking of retcons, they retconned it back to not doing that. But now it looks like this one does at least. <laughs> no, not the dreaded fate of being a theater kid. The fate that Aaron wholeheartedly embraced in high school. Ah, but at least I uh, knocked it off eventually. Nah, I'm kidding. I have so much love for the theater. But Theater Kid is definitely a vibe. You can't go into it half-heartedly. You have to fully embrace it with every fiber of your being. And that does things to a man. Dark things. <laughs> oh no, it accidentally just turns into a Harry Potter stream. <laughs> An aggressively reconstructivist Harry Potter stream. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Yeah, and I, th I, d I mean, you all know what I think. I've been talking pretty extensively about my philosophy of literary interpretation for a while now, but I do think there's something that is, if not nice, at least okay about being able to 
celebrate and return to the works that meant a lot to you as a kid or at any point in your life because it's not as if the works are gone it's not as if that meaning is gone but also recognizing that that's different than the author whom you don't want to endorse and if you don't want to endorse that author by not buying any further things so much the better more power to you Ah, Grail, but what if I told you that your anguish could be a fun Praxis game? <laughs> See, that's the problem with being as meta as we are. We can go up or down as many levels as necessary to make you suffer with theoretical justification. Visit Pascal. You sound like an owl. It's these machines. They're a bit different from the ones I'm familiar with. But once I fiddle around with them, they seem simple enough. Fascinating. Adaptation is the hallmark of an exceptional engineer. Emerod, if you don't mind me asking, who are the Amarcians? If you are so curious to ask, they were a group of engineers who maintained the technologies of Fodra. I myself used to be counted among their number. Wait, you're an Amarcian as well? If that's the case, is it possible that you and Pascal are distant relatives? Relatives? No. I fear you have misunderstood me. Amarcia was just the name for a coalition of research engineers. Though bonds were strong, none shared any blood. Type. Whoa, what? What? We're not all in the same This is place. such a huge thing to drop in a skit. To return the money I borrowed from Poisson. Don't borrow money from children. <laughs> Wait, but so that's so cool and so funny, and now I have so many follow-up questions. No, I don't have so many. But you'll remember that when all of the glyphs, the summon equivalents, resonated and bonded and formed pacts with Pascal, it was all in reference to her bloodline and lineage, which we naturally assumed to be the Amarcian lineage. <laughs> but if it's just like, like the JRPG equivalent of MIT, then does that mean that like Pascal's actual specific family, nothing to do with the Amarcians, has a special bond with the elements of the world? Like that's, that raises so many other questions and makes Pascal so much more intrinsically interesting to me. Oh, I wanna know more. I hope the game tells us more. Yeah, it's just, it's nuts, Critzy. I mean, I haven't read the books in a long time, but you, you have to almost imagine with some of the things she's saying, it's like, how, do you, like, do, do, do you, do, do you not see the connections between he who must not be named and your utterances? Like, are you that, are you that recalcitrant in your views or are you just that tone deaf or are you just that rich that you don't care about it anymore? But then I would think if you're that rich, the only thing you would care about is your reputation. So I, ah, you just scratch your head and then ugh, vomit and move on at some point, I guess. Vom and move on as my UK brethren and sisterin would say. Is brethren gender neutral? I should know that. It feels gender neutral to me, but I don't, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I get that sense of betrayal. That makes a lot of sense to me. Is this the machine that can fix Sophie? <laughs> no one will ever know, it's a mystery. Please set Protoss haste down here, if you will. Oh no. I will begin the procedure. Not Sakuraba-san's suspenseful music track. Not the same track that was playing way back in the catacombs 50 hours ago. Not probably more like 45 hours ago. Initiating particle restoration.
This also evokes to me the image of Luke in the replication machine. That's your answer to everything. They should have given her a spirit grail. What the? Is that Sophie and Pascal? What's happening here? Is it a memory? Don't look at me. How should I know? Some of the particles that float into the system have assembled themselves into visual form. Are we gonna have to fight them? <laughs> Pascal, wait! <gasps> <gasps> Oh, it is just a memory. Our favorite memory. I'm gonna touch you. This evokes Final Fantasy VII in an interesting lateral way too. I'm scared. I'm scared. These appear to be Protos Hase's memories of you. I believe you should investigate them. Let's start with Malik. Our boy. What have they done to our boy? He's luminescent. get to see one? I feel so let down. It's happening again. Well, now what? Richard. Richard? Emil slash Ratatosk wants to know your location. No, oh, when he first found her. That's one of the cool experiences of coordination between character activity and player activity that JRPGs are able to do also, because you look at something like that and it was literally years ago for the characters. It was also like, what, at least a month ago for us? And certainly like almost 60 hours ago at this point. So it really does feel like we're reaching back into past recollections just by dint of the expanse of time in the game. It's a great way of binding us to the experiences of these parties. Hubert. I'm glad we got to see all of them after all. This is cool too because um, I don't know whether Emerod will explain this more, but she said that if I read her right, and I think I did, these were in part a byproduct of the particles flowing back into Sophie to reconstitute her, which then in terms of this collective identity that we were talking about raises the question, are these the experiences of the others that Sophie remembers? Are these the other party members' memories of their own personal time with Sophie? 
is there even a distinction there or because of their interrelationships does that just sum to the same thing interesting to think about the perspective that attaches to those if any <laughs> yeah not usually the clots Face to the name? Something like a face. I must destroy him. It's been a long time. Everyone get out! Right now. Sophie, watch out! Everyone stay oh. out of the game! How about this? Strike! Be gone! A memory that packs a punch. Weak to AR, it's okay. There you go, Grail. You got it. <laughs> the true um, Inception style totem as to the reality of Richard, whether or not he shoots unfair laser beams. I think you mentioned this before, Grail, but the fact that all of um, Sherry's invocations ask these various metaphysical forces to give names to themselves. Pretty cool. Pretty tightly connected with some of those themes we've been wrestling with. Oh my god, another Elith break? Give us one of those, dude. It costs you nothing. That was Rose level re dying on Sherry's part. I don't know if we have anything we could spear it. Yeah, pretty potent memory. There's no doubt about that. Something in there, too, about a memory being so strong or having such a grip on your psyche that it shapes reality for you. It's one of those things that you might not think of as immediately metaphorical in the way that you were talking about pottery, but which seems to have a lot of applicability to a lot of what the game is concerned with. <laughs> what a line from Hubert. That sums it up, doesn't it? So, that was Lambda? That's true. He didn't shout out a single animal name during his attacks. That's how you know he deserves it. Evil monster! Ah! I forgot she had wings. Uh. 
us, Bell. Sophie! You're awake. We did it. You're all here. Sophie, can you see us? How do you feel? Is everything okay? This is an obvious point, but worth noting just because it's so cool. Um, thinking about the way in which the game bookends and reiterates upon itself in thematically meaningful ways the idea that back in the childhood arc Sophie was the one who took it upon herself in that unilateral way we were talking about to protect everyone else from Lambda and now in order to call Sophie back to their group and those friendships everyone else had to basically help her psychically work through that trauma that was put upon her by defeating Lambda without her for her sake what a nice symmetry that provides to the bonds of the party and a nice way for the party to um, respond to the unilateral um, way in which Sophie protects and stands up for them and expresses herself to them. Yes, I, I think so. Oh, Sophie, I'm so glad you're all right. You all saved me. Thank you. It seems you have failed to eliminate Lambda, Protos, hey? I've been busy! I made friends! The mission I have to complete? Uh, what was it? Why does it hurt to remember? This uh, existential headache actually also feels very Luke. I'm seeing all of these parallels now that I've started to. Sophie? How odd. I was sure the particle reconstruction was a complete success. Life maintenance functions appear to be fully restored. But I do see some problems with the information integration. Would you mind returning to the machine we used earlier? I'd like to make some final adjustments. <laughs> well, L Luke, but cool from the beginning. <laughs> Maybe that's the distinction. That's fine. Can you make it, Sophie? Is it fine, Asbel? Can you really not read between the lines of what Emerod is saying? Yes. Very well. Let's go back. Bro. I know you're not the sharpest tool in the shed, but come on. You did train under Captain Malik. None of the machines here have any insights for us now. Okay. What's outdoor number two? Oh, actually, before I run headfirst into more enemies, maybe we should tap up on that save. Even without a protracted discussion of metaphors, it's worth saving. The reason why. What did you mean by information integration? Oh, now you, you ask? You Fuck you, Asbel. Protos Haste has no memories from before a certain point in time, correct? When we first met her, Sophie had lost her memories. That was about seven years ago. I don't know what transpired before that point, but the missing parts surely include memories of how Proto's haste came to Athenia. Do you think you'll be able to recover them? I will not actually be restoring memories, but I will assist Proto's haste in recalling the reason it was sent to Athenia. The reason she came to our world. That's interesting too. Put a philosophical pin in that out of um, Kant's pin cushion. I guess any philosopher of normativity's pin cushion, but that idea that I'm not going to give her back memories, I'm going to give her back a reason she's lost as an organizing principle for her actions. That strikes me as, well, something that's intrinsically interesting, but also something that we might get some mileage out of in terms of the difference between Telos and uh, our memories or lived experiences of the world. <laughs> Fuck you, Grail. You're right up there with Asbel. You're just on the other side of it. <laughs> Uh, you're all the real monsters. Lambda's a good guy. He's just sorely misunderstood. 
Oh, this is just an elevator all the way back? Okay. Um, I think... I think the first one was on basement two. Yeah, that might have been smarter. Oh, but it says basement two. This is one of those instances, speaking of maps, where like dungeon specific maps would have some utility. But another one of those cases where it raises an interesting question to me in terms of, especially given how kind of wonky and intricate this world's relationship with maps is more broadly, like, all right, what is, what does lack of maps this say about the way in which the party navigates the world? I should have checked, Grail, I'm sorry. Didn't even think of it. Now, please look at this. I remember. I remember my mission. Lambda. I must destroy Lambda. Listen now, her voice has changed. You are filled with determination. No! What's going on? It seems the procedure was a success. What are you talking about? Yeah, spell you blockhead. Protos Haste is a weapon created to destroy Lambda. In the words of Marta, the most quotable character in all of the Tale series, you blockhead! This information, however, had become confused, so I simply reaffirmed what she needed to know. Next time, I will destroy him. I will finish this. Lambda. Could it be? Playing with your blocks again, are you? I don't think that's just any male researcher. If so, then you should smile like this. may influence a soul just as a soul can shape a body just look at the child every day he becomes more and more human do you have any idea at all why i put so much effort into raising him as a human being it's because i okay what was that i think he said the word lambda it's what he called that little kid Oh, her face. Emerald, is Lambda human? No, of course not. He is a monster that infects and feeds off other life forms. Just like a parasite. Hmm. There's that word of yours, Chrissy. So perhaps Richard has been infected. Does that mean we have to fight Richard in order to defeat Lambda? No, that can't be. Sophie, are you okay? Perhaps that's as far as it can go. Is she still sick? Some minor data confusion remains, but it is nothing to worry about. I must destroy Lambda, but Lambda is... Aspel, tell me, what is Lambda? Well, how do I explain this? Protos Haze, you exist to destroy Lambda. This is your sole reason for existence. <laughs> yeah, you got it, Grail. We're getting there. The form Lambda takes makes no difference. This time, you must destroy it no matter what the cost. Wait, hold on. Sophie doesn't want to fight Lambda because of Richard. I share the same sentiment. We all do. Emerald, there must be something you can do. Wait. We aren't sure that Richard has been taken over completely, which means we can't give up. 
Yeah, and it might be possible to communicate with Lambda, too. It's way too soon to give up. Are you planning to parlay with Lambda? Not just Lambda. Richard, too. Asbel. This is a problem that affects all of us, Sophie. We got into this together, and we'll solve it together. Together as one. Wait, what's happening? Our power is resonating. What does that mean? Your powers come from me. I am their source. That's how you saved us before, right? By sharing your power. No. It's you who saved me. You gave me the power to change who I was. Mm. So you saved our lives. By naming and her then Sophie. We managed to save you. This light connects us together. Wow, okay. Now I'm super jealous. <laughs> Indeed. The two most on the outside of everything. Uh, but my two favorites. Pascal. Captain. Uh, don't worry about it. Let's just get back home, smash that cocoon, and find Richard. I hope they get to go off on an awesome side adventure. I'm afraid that even the power of Protoss haste will not be enough to breach the cocoon. Oh, come on. There's got to be a way. Well, I suppose you could reinforce your shuttle and then attempt to break through. Yeah, and it adds in another layer that is very Tales and we've talked about before, but um, not in a while, Pottery, but going all the way back to Tales of Symphonia, the idea of um, characters kind of explicitly referencing and interpreting symbolism as part of the story and the, the meaning according to which they orient themselves in the world, um, like the gang in Symphonia does with the artifacts that are dropped from the various aspects of Mythos that you can fight in Walgaia before Mythos. So too, we have Sophie giving her own interpretation and explanation of what exactly was going on um, with her particles and the nature of who saved whom. Let's do that. We need a specific attachment to break through the cocoon, but it's available only at a military facility known as Bathish Citadel. Assuming you can find it, we can make the necessary repairs. Bathish is a name that does not is mean the anything Citadel to me. Far from here. All right then, we have our plan. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess even Pascal is like more connected with everything that's happening than poor Malik is. We can stop at the Citadel on our way back to tell us as to. Perfect. Let's go. Malik trained Asbel, though, and then Asbel saved Malik, so it's, it's kind of connected. Sophie acquired the Pact Maker title. All right. Look at that one. Pact Maker? No, Ace of the Fist. Pact maker, yes. Proof of the pact made on Lot Hill that their friendship would never end. Really interesting that she only got that now. Like only once she's been able to clarify and reconstitute her identity is she able to really finally make sense of the pact. Which makes sense if you remember how she was kind of desperately trying to use the pact as a way of reaching out to Richard, not really understanding the content of that, but just seeing it as a kind of diffuse way of fixing things and avoiding the conflict. <laughs> the art of all time, which, uh, which art was mine? I didn't even see. Gauntlet Blitz! All right. Okay, now we're going all the way back. Oh, but I'll save and then we can go and take the elevator now that it's connected to everything. I think that'll be a little less of a headache. Yeah, this was definitely a labyrinthine dungeon, wasn't it? You know why I can say with with gusto that you're absolutely right, Grail? It's that that move is so intense, I vividly remember it just from Sophie beating on us with it in Tales of Hysteria. <laughs> That's how memorable it is. And now she has it here. Interesting too as we go forward. So we, 
I think it's good not to put too much of the cart before the horse and to let a lot of this great exposition that we're getting unfold and wrestle with it as the characters are wrestling with it. But I will say, now that we have the sense that Lambda is a, um, I went the wrong way. Now that Lambda, now that we know Lambda is this parasite inhabiting Richard, and we go back and we think about Sophie's struggle with, well, oh, Richard is my friend, but I have to destroy Lambda. Notice that's also deeply resonant with a lot of what we've been thinking about in terms of how the different titles and names and interpretations we can give to people can radically change the way in which they think about themselves and the way in which we relate to them. I think about something like Asbel wrestling with whether he's Asbel the Lord of Lot or Asbel the Knight, Asbel the Sun, uh, and the different um, aspects of him that are put in focus and branded relevant for interactions with him uh, for certain people according to those interpretations. And so while it's clear within the game that yes, Richard and Lambda are different people, I think it's interesting to ask, especially as we go on and see how they may or may not be similar from one another. Well, similar to how Sophie is like the specific sci-fi organism, but also a really useful symbol for thinking about a lot of the rest of the party members and people more broadly. Well, can we also mount something similar with the idea of Lambda and Richard, where there are two very different sides according to which we can engage with a single entity right? This object that is kind of Richard, kind of Lambda, kind of maybe something else. And how does our choice of the terms on which to engage with that object inform what relationships are possible and what outcomes are possible from those interactions? Oh, sorry if I, uh, well, maybe I didn't miss the save point since it just jumped us and it's outside the dungeon. Good, so I think we're all good. Instant ramen is always necessary. Never apologize for the necessity of instant ramen. <laughs> apologize for making me hungry, which is what you will be doing. <laughs> be careful. If you feel faint, just have Asbel carry you again. Even if he's not very good at it. You jerk. Just make sure you don't drop her. <laughs> Pascal's curious face. Sharing that power must be what makes them so close. Oh, you know what's funny? I just got it. When Pascal has that curious animation and she's tilting her head, she looks like Evie. She looks like my dog when she's curious because Evie will also tilt her head back and forth. Like she doesn't quite understand what's going on, but she's very interested in it. <laughs> I love that. It took me 55 hours to place that. I think there's more to it than that. I wish I magical powers. Pascal, you can literally form pacts with the manifestations of the basic elemental aspects that undergird the entire world. I think you have magical powers. Hey, Sophie, can you make it so the captain and me are all zippy zappy like you guys? That's right. She was the pet. Pascal was the mascot all along. That's why her clothes and hair are so silly. <laughs> Makes sense. It's a great head tilt. We may learn something that can help you at Bathus Citadel. For seriously? Tell us about her bloodline! Indeed. It was our main research center regarding the abilities of Protos Haze. Oh heck yeah! Come on guys, let's go! We're off on an adventure. But first, I want to go back to Telos whatever the second word was, to um, fulfill that request. Emerod said that Lambda was a being that feeds off other life. And to restart. I'm a humanoid that was created to destroy Lambda. That's my purpose. That's right, thank you. Don't talk like that, Sophie. But it's true. It's reality. So if this Cornell guy is the one who was responsible for raising Lambda, then who were Sophie's parents? What are you suggesting? Emerod said that Cornell was some big shot humanoid researcher, yeah? So was there someone else capable of making Sophie? Hmm. His name is Van de Stelka Grants. Piggybacking off the research of Jade Curtis. 
The only two who could ever hatch such a scheme. I can't lose. What do you get when you remember a purpose that is by definition all consuming? It consumes you. Interesting to see whether and how Sophie will find her way back from that telos which has been re-ingrained within her. Great work, Captain. You're not doing so bad there yourself, Asbel. Did he get that CC pump that we were looking for? No, he's still waiting on that. Oh, but he's so close. Can we use one of those bottles? I feel like that's pretty close to the right amount to not burn too much of it. Yeah, let's do that. Good, good. Host to the light. I wanted to see if there are any more CC granting titles that we had missed. Because I feel like that would be helpful to us. But I'm sure they're also rare for obvious reasons. A lot of bench experience. The most useful thing. Exceed. There we go. Perfect. Just what I was waiting for! <laughs> to quote another great Jameson Price character. That's right, yeah, Amarad is really covering off all the bases we've been missing. <laughs> Isn't she, girl? Oh, you're right, I'm so dumb. I, I meant to add Sophie back, and I just I got distracted retooling as well. I'll do that after this fight. Thank you, girl. Yeah, well, the the um, the late game tutorials were really helpful for that, so that's why I'm chasing the weapon quality stuff now. So I'm hopeful that will happen for us sooner or later. But yeah, I think it certainly won't hurt to also prioritize those titles, especially now that we have a broader art palette. Did we want to replace Malik though? Because I feel like we we had also been chasing his hidden mystic art, right? And we certainly won't be able to work towards that if he's out of the party. And look, he's very gradually building up usage of Sonic Mount. Now let's replace, I know you love Hubert, but let's replace Hubert for the moment. Or maybe Sharia, because uh, Sophie can heal now. Why don't we do that? How about that? Some of the original gang and then also Malik. <laughs> oh boy. Enemies. Oh, I see. You jones in for a victory quote. Well, we can always mix up the party again in a bit. This is what happens when you misjudge your foe. Fifteen minutes on the clock. I try to be efficient in the town and then we'll roll on. Preserve mankind, hopes, bridge, gap between, protect, precious. God, these poor humanoids. Let's get there. Thank 
Hmm? Error code, no response. There you go. Nope. This was so long ago. Yeah, same thing happened with the engineer one. <laughs> I know, he's the real um, metaphysical magician in this world, isn't he, Just? I'm assuming we'll get the brooch um, in the, the research center for Protoss Haste where we're going next. That would make sense to me. Oh, good. We actually have gold right now, too, so it'll be an opportune moment for restockage and maybe a little dualizage. Dualization. Um, can you give me item shop first? I want to make sure that we at least have life bottles. That's my main concern. I think the rest of this is okay. Maybe I'll top off the panacea bottles, too. Oh, since Basilisk likes, just love to petrify. And let's see, so with equipment, uh, that would also help CC, so that's a no-brainer for me. We can afford two. All right. I think that's good. We just got Sophie back. It's great to invest in Asbel. Happy camper. Listen, I say it every time you mention it, but I'm going to keep saying it because I desperately want to keep the faith. I really believe there is a, a genuine chance that with the way Bamco is operating, they will uh, they have a localization of the non-localized games in their roadmap. So keep the faith. It costs you nothing to keep the faith, so... Why not keep it? Okay, the Mithril Sword is what we actually want to enhance. I saw a couple new qualities. Apocal. That's a good word. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be... Although maybe just the, the newness overrides whether it's a better quality, so might as well do that. Uh, let's do the HP boosting one. Cool. Cool. And, uh, oh, fuck me. We already got one for Sophie. I forgot that. Well, we can sell one, I guess. Uh, good. And for the other ones, uh, well, actually, first, let's, let's go through the motions here so we can sell the other... Mithril gauntlets. That's not going to give us enough to get another weapon anyway, so we can go back and just dualize the ones that we have. What does the Dark Shine Crystal dualize with? Ooh, a Frenzy Rod. That seems cool. Boost the effects of Krios. Yeah, I think it's been showing me that on the mini menu, because I feel like I've been keeping track of it. Although mostly right now I'm hunting qualities, so... I'm, I'm kind of trying to prioritize that, but yes, I appreciate the reminder. Uh, Got that, and now we don't have gold. Decisive dice, okay. Oh, these sell for a lot. I like that. Yeah, that's fair. I'm just I'm, I'm doing the buying right now just because the um, 
you know, we're at the stage in the game where the new weapons still have better CC, which I feel like is just very helpful for us. Or at least for my playstyle, so far as it goes. Hand of Glory! Oh, Mamma Mia! Candelabrum in the shape of a hand used in divination. How about that? The theory of evolution? A seed that no one will tell you the name of, probably because it's too hard to... Oh, no, that's the definition of the, the secret seed. But what about a book that chronicles everything from the past to the future? That's awesome. <laughs> you can sell it for 2,000 gold. <laughs> Maybe keep a copy and fucking read it, why don't you? Demon's Bane Arrow. Warns off evil but won't hurt monsters if fired. Oh yay, we actually have some things that we can sell for money. That helps. Fabulous. Oh, I gotta make Espo fabulous. I know, well, it's kind of like the score, isn't it? Uh, at least in terms of that little description that we saw, which raises so many questions about what, if anything, is the story about how it was actually, uh, you know, written. What were people tapping into? Is there some particular aspect of the flow of energy in the universe that uh, can represent the flow of historic events similar to the score? So many follow-up questions. All right, I think that's good enough for now. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. And... Need to equip Asbo and Sophie with the new weapons. Love it. Love it. Okay, that didn't take too long. <laughs> yes, it's just the most radically literal text of which you could conceive in the deeply symbolic world of Tales of Greece's F. That's the joke. That's why it's so powerful. It just tells things as they are. Okay, and we're off. Like you said, you have deadline completions to celebrate. And everyone knows that the only good way to celebrate that is with way too much sodium. <laughs> I know, I think I was saying this last time, but that's part of what's so interesting to me about the structure of this game's antagonist versus many of the Tales antagonists. Although not all of them, some others of them are like this. Just the fact that they're kind of off on their own and mostly kind of just hanging out and lurking on their own for a large part of the story. Just kind of waiting for you. But cool, too, because if you remember with that last window we saw into Richard, I mean, I say cool, maybe haunting or foreboding is a better word. But remember, it's not as if he's just hanging out there. Like It's almost like he's he and or Lambda is lulling he or them into some kind of trance. OK, 
and just repeating the almost meditative mantra of needing to return all the energy to the world, bring an end to war. So it's almost like he needs to do something to himself before he can do anything else. Maybe it's a more active waiting than uh, you might need with this guy. Oh, so funny. I, I confused you talking about someone else hanging out in the planet's core for the other person we have hanging out in the planet's core. <laughs> Oh, neat. There you go. So that's something. I want that chest. Give me that chest. Thank you so much. It's just money. Sophie. Oh. Isn't it so nice to have Sophie back? As we've been talking about over the last few streams, they really do make you, f speaking of feeling the weight of time in the playthrough, you really feel um, the lack of her presence in the party. And now to have it back, it's just, it's a triumph for us as much as it is for the party members. I know, I was smiling at that too. Just the biggest gauntlets you've ever seen. This looks like a fort a child would build. When I was little, I made these all the time. I set up anti-personnel traps and ran from my sister, and then was all, pshoo! Anti-personnel traps. This world used to be home to a great many people, many of them exceptionally gifted, just as Pascal here. But the monsters created by Lambda triggered a massive war, and now you see what our world has become. You know, I'll admit it now, but I was kind of worried that maybe it was the Amarsians who ruined everything. I bet you're pretty relieved that wasn't the case. Indeed, the fault for this lies with Lambda alone. And, as we know from other JRPGs, it's not going to get any more complicated than that. Now anyway, let's go to the next area, on a totally unrelated note. Region 66. Enter Region 66. I've been thinking about Athenia as of late. We have no way of knowing how things are progressing there. It's pretty stressy, huh? 
Can you use Poisson's communication device to contact anyone? I find it unlikely that a bird could fly all the way to our world. Well, let's just see. Off you go, birdie. And? It came back. I don't think this will work. Then I guess it's the reinforced shuttle or nothing if we want to return. That time is already upon us. We should hurry. Yeah. You okay? That's right, because as we know, people only ever re-emphasize facts over and over again if those facts are true and everybody knows it. There are no conceivable ulterior motives. What? Agenda? No! Oh, that little dino fellow is adorable. That's sick. I was about to dodge that. Even in battle, it's important to pay your respects. Okay. <laughs> Not like that. This? No, I... Never mind. Yeah, but the little ones are so cute. We need magic to defeat Douse. Oh, Cress. But at what cost? Cress, did you know? I imagine a can grail, but I just, I feel like every time I've been showing up at the shops recently, I'm short of funds. So, I mean, given that it's a JRPG, I'm sure that equation will change at some point. I just, I don't know, what do you think? I feel like it's, it's a little too early for me to be using it in terms of cash flow. Maybe I'm prioritizing the wrong things. Perhaps I've walked this earth for far too long. This earth? Malik, we got here like a couple days ago. Alright, I got two dad jokes in this stream. It's Friday, I'm allowed. Let's do this! I can't say that I didn't see this coming. Oh yeah, I guess uh, now you've met another one of your friends who's really lazy. I feel like toggling it in and out every other battle feels like a, a big chore. But yeah, maybe um, maybe that's a good trade-off to make. Well. Just every now and then. We can definitely just try it out on um, the next turn and see how it goes. That changes the equation. Because my eyes are bad. What? Are they dangerous? 
Yes. Somebody save me. <laughs> All right. Well, we're already over time, so uh, I respect everyone's time and save our uh, adventure through the Citadel for Monday. But let's we'll get us to the next save point, then we can wrap things up for the evening. Yeah, I like that idea, Grail. Maybe just switching it up by area. Or even by screen, right? That feels like less of a chore to me. Like if we went from like one basement floor to another in the, uh, the research facility, just switching the load up. She's invincible, incorruptible, indignation. No, she doesn't know that one. Unsettling garden. Oh. Lump of clay. Most mainly of Krios. Uh, am I the only one finding it hard to breathe? You've been under constant pressure since we came to this world. Maybe looking at those flowers would re uh, Huh? What is it? Those aren't real flowers. They're just made out of clay. No, Sharia. Those are real flowers. What? It is true. When they lost their Elith, they transformed into that clay-like substance. Ugh, like the hollowing. Lost their Elith? You mentioned some difficulty breathing. The disappearance of Elith is the cause of that as well. Very soon, this world will be completely dead. Mm. That can't be. The world will die? Sounds like yes, Rena. the Elith that springs from the planet's core has run dry. I think we're getting a little window into what it was that they were doing on Athenia. Long time, the street to full many people, but destroyed selves. <laughs> At least such thing as a garden which does not unsettle, which allows one to retain one's composure. Okay, maybe not all of it. Look, if there's one thing we should be learning from this wonderful adventure we're on together, it's that many aspects of these games manifest in the others, which is part of what makes it such a layered and rewarding series. It definitely does, I think, help to hone your intuition about this game if you are coming into it after having played Arise. Like, I don't know if I had as firm a sense of what was going on we the first time I played it, it but especially best. after having very recently that played Arise and Beyond it? the Dawn, it, uh, it seems more straightforward. Yeah, I can almost imagine it as like a lush green expanse with those waterfalls cascading down, maybe to a lake or something. It is cool, and I think it's a testament to the just the richness of the world in games such as this that at least for me you know you hear the story of how the land used to be lush and now it's dying and you juxtapose that against some of the other areas we've been to and what we know about how Elith works and you can like you can work yourself into imagining what this very area would look like under a very different ecological condition <laughs>
that your skills are quite impressive. <laughs> Aren't you sweet? You know, I'm always influenced by... Um, I don't even know where this would come from if it was from, like, uh, just watching, like, National Geographic or something, but um, I'm struck by how lush desert ecosystems can actually be because you say desert, and it sounds like this kind of dying, devoid area, but they have tons of flora and fauna and, and richly interactive forms of life. Um, so if anything, I think, you know, this game can really do like justice to that by honing our ecological intuitions um, by contrasting a desert with an actual dying world and how different those two things are. A dying world, right? I mean, I, I don't know if this is a great comparison, but what I immediately thought of when we stepped out of the spaceship, and I remember thinking this the first time I played the game too, is like not a desert so much as just like Mars, right? Like a place that maybe it used to have water, now it doesn't, that kind of aesthetic. Beyond this military facility, access civilians strictly inhibited. Civilians can't enter this place. It's a military place. All right, there was a star, so I'll, I'll do the star and then we'll save and wrap things up. Do you guys see a sparkle down there? Yeah, I wonder what it is. Oh, is it a brooch? I think we can get down to it from over there. Are you sure? It looks dangerous. Sherry, Sophie, you two wait here. Hmm? What's wrong, Sophie? Hmm. A Sophie flashback! Ooh. What is it? I have a tummy ache. Can you carry me to the city? Why? Why? Jeez, you must be broken. One moment. I don't detect any damage. Then listen when a human tells you to do something. Hey, wait, why are you going ahead without me? I don't know. You don't know? Sheesh, now I don't even care about my stupid stomach. Wait, I get it. You're testing me, aren't you? Hmm? Before he died, my dad used to say that a little bribery goes a long way. Does it? Hmm, <laughs> you're a cheeky humanoid, aren't you? Okay, fine. You want me to treat you like a human, right? Now, where did I put it? A uh, human? What's this? It's my favorite brooch. It'll help you look a little more presentable. Anyway, just take it. See the flowers? They're really cute, right? Oh, wow. Flowers? Cute? There. I just treated you like a human. And he treated her like a human by giving her not just something of his but also something that is floral so talk about having imprinted within your mind as a model for treating like a human what asbel then takes a step further not just through the flowers but actually by naming her and giving her that different sense of identity um, by naming her after a flower that's awesome a uh, human jesus Yee! Nova Monster confirmed. Initiating com... Oh. Initiating combat. You okay, Sophie? They made it. Hey, we found it. What is it? Oh, it's just some old broken brooch. Does it have flowers on it? Yes, it looks like something a child might wear. Can you please bring it up? Like this? It's cute. So do you always wear jewelry you find lying on the ground? Or is this a special occasion? Hmm. It's a secret. A secret? Boy, oh boy. Tee hee. Come on, let's go. Oh. And a, another 
touching instance of a side quest and memory and resolution that's just for her, as we've been talking about in the last few such adventures. Stirred from Detachment. What a great name for a title. Let's dig right into that one. She lost someone important right before her eyes. It was at that moment she truly awakened. And yet again, what a great little instance of title storytelling uh, and a great moment on which to wrap up the stream. Because right there, again, while we might not get it from the main story, it might not be the kind of thing that warrants raising with the other party members, it can help us to understand that in fact what Asbel and his friends uh, did for Sophie was really picking up the mantle of what that kid made possible uh, and gave her a prototypical understanding of through that gesture that then allowed her to um, work with Asbel to define a new sense of self beyond her programmed purpose. That's awesome. And it comes with Shot Staff Blast, which is icing on the cake. Oh, this game, this game. My friends, I'm enjoying it so much with you. I don't want it to end, and ain't that good news, because it's got 4X and we're not done with the third. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's an Ouroboros, Grail. See, it all comes back around. And all the more fitting that it would end with a... a uh, well, I guess that doesn't have to be a shout out to Xenoblade Chronicles, but in this day and age and with us, I think the shout out is implied. Oh, friends, what a nice Friday stream. How rewarding to be able to start off the weekend on this note of thoughtful gaming and digging deep into literary criticism and the philosophy of literature with you all. That was really fun and rewarding. And I have a feeling that, especially as we're at this stage in this late of a playthrough in the stream, um, and also this late stage in the playthrough itself, we'll only be digging further into that, uh, which is so rewarding. I think to take things back to a high level and to frame the coming week, uh, <laughs> at least until my buddies get here on Friday, at which point all bets will be off, but I know I'll have a fun and rewarding time, but perhaps a time of a different color. Um, I think the, the higher level uh, consideration I would ask you to keep in mind, which we were digging very deep into in this stream, is just we're reaching the point in the story at which things come to a head and at which point many things in the story start getting explained, like we saw with Emerod explaining the nature of Sophie as Protos Haste and now what was going on with that glow that had been dogging those characters throughout the game. Emerald herself seems in, in many dimensions to be the character that explains the things we'd been experiencing all along. And so I would ask us as we go forward, uh, especially if this is something that's kind of a new way of engaging with these games for you, that's awesome. Um, especially if you're watching the VOD, I hope you come up and consider joining the conversations on Twitch uh, because it really is a real live book club and this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of that conversation and the literary study part of the book club and the enjoying of the game. Um, but if you hadn't asked those questions before of the kind that Grail and Pottery uh, and Chrissy and I were talking about in terms of, well, what are you looking for out of an interpretation? And how does that desire to get a certain meaning out of the game color what you attend to, what you don't? how you think about things like an explanation of these particles beyond their material implications for the plot, start asking yourself those questions. Uh, pick up a game and play it this weekend, uh, whether it's an old or new game, and look at some of the moments in it and ask, what are ways beyond its literal meaning that can help me to get further insight uh, and import from this game that might even allow me to see my own life, uh, my own actions in different ways. And I guarantee no matter what answers you land on, if you start asking those questions, like the kinds of questions that we've started developing as a language and a mode of engagement with these Tales games, like the questions of what are titles doing here? What do mountains have to do with it? Um, what are these relationships and how do they sprawl between the main plot and the side quests? You're only going to find more layers with which to New Game Plus what you get out of these stories. And especially when the stories are so damn long, I would venture to say that the more value you can extract from them, 
<laughs> not in a parasitic way like Lambda, but purely in the way of thoughtful consumerism, if you will, or being a thoughtful gamer, uh, the happier you'll be for it and the more you'll be able to contribute to these conversations and these communities. So everyone wins. Uh, I've certainly won tonight. I hope that you feel the same way. And I'm looking forward to another week of this uh, with you all, my friends. <laughs> Yes, join us, join us. Pottery, thank you, my friend. Grail, pleasure seeing you. I would love to see you eating your shoe, so everyone do everything that Grail says so that he'll have to eat his shoe. Chrissy, so great to see you. Um, <laughs> oh, you're sweet. You can always talk over me. That's why we always have the, the catch up after the final monologue and then the final goodbye. It's the natural flow to the stream. But yes, congratulations on meeting your deadline, Chrissy. Um, thank you all for your thoughtful contributions in the chat. I love, love, love when people speak up. And I think we're getting to know each other to the point where, uh, as is the case with JRPG parties who journey together for a while, um, we feel more comfortable and willing to share our different views on things, add those to the pot. And I, I can feel that energy coming through on the stream and in these studies. So I hope you can too. That's part of what makes me excited to fire this up every time we stream. I hope you enjoy that too. Um, and as always, my friends, I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you think well. I hope you game well. Uh, and I hope you don't miss this rich and rewarding climax to everything we've been working on in Tales of Graces F. We'll be digging right back in, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern, this Monday. Be there. Don't miss it. I'll be doing roll call, so don't be late. Cheers, friends. Have a good one. I'll see you next time. I'm Aaron Saduko, founder of With a Terrible Fate. This has been Tales of Praxis. Cheers. <laughs>